Good afternoon, and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I'm Council Member Ben Kalis, the chair of this subcommittee. Uh, today we are joined by uh, Land Use Chair Salmanca, Council Member Inez Barron, as well as Council Member Diane Ayala, both of whom have items on the agenda today from their districts. I want to apologize to those in attendance. Uh, the City Council has multiple hearings as we speak uh, and uh, we have the challenge of trying to be in more than one place at a time. Uh, for my part I was coming from the Parks Committee hearing where we were talking about funding for parks which are literally falling into the river and other parks which are being privatized at $180 an hour. Yes, in New York City you have to pay $180 if you want to use a park on the east side. Uh, today we'll be holding uh, four public hearings and we'll be voting on two applications. Uh, the applications we will be voting on were the subject of prior hearings. We will now move on, to, we, we will now start with our public hearing on land use items 52 through 59. And we'll begin with land use item 59, the 17, 721 Van Sicklin HDFC tax exemption application for property located in Councilmember Barron's district in Brooklyn. Pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, this 40-year tax exemption would not only facilitate the renovation of the building, but also remove the property from a list of buildings slated for third-party transfer around 10 foreclosure auctions. Uh, so the uh, plain language on this one is uh, we've got some property. This property ended up uh, as a uh, cooperative and uh, the cooperative has uh, some outstanding uh, money that it owes the city in the form of back taxes and uh, paying for water because yes, even though you don't see it on your rental bill all the time, land, uh, tenants, uh, landlords have to pay for their water bill. And so when a building hasn't paid its rent or sorry, hasn't paid its taxes or hasn't paid its water bills, uh, they will sometimes be uh, put into foreclosure where they are then auctioned off to a third party, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit to take over management of the building. In this case, the city has stepped in uh, to work with the tenants in creating an HDFC and uh, using a retroactive tax abatement to keep the property affordable and uh, use that money to help take care of the outstanding debt as well as working to pay off the amounts owed to the water uh, for water and uh, to make sure that the building gets into a state of good repair. Okay. Uh, so I'm hoping that that was the most accurate, well, very uh, uh, broad description of what's going on here. And so from HPD, Housing Preservation and Development, we have Artie Pearson, Director of Land Use, uh, and we also have their uh, testimony uh, submitted. Uh, so I will now ask our council to swear you into the... Please state your name. Artie Pearson. Malcolm Morse. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Land use number 59 consists of an exemption area containing one privately owned building located at 721 Van Sicklin Avenue. That's block 4329 lot one in Brooklyn Council District 42. This property is a candidate for foreclosure under the third party transfer program in rim action number 53, round 10 for which HPD is seeking article 11 tax benefits. 721 Van Sicklin Avenue was taken into city ownership in 1982 and subsequently entered into the tenant land use, the tenant interim lease program on March 31st, 1998. HPD conveyed the property to the existing occupants as low-income cooperatives with household income capped at 120% of AMI. The building is a mixed-use four-story walk-up with 38 residential units and four commercial spaces, of which one is used as an office by the board. It is fully occupied and comprises 33 one-bedrooms, three two-bedrooms, one one-bedroom, and one superintendent's unit. Of the 38 units, 21 are home ownership and 15 are rental. The commercial spaces are mainly mop and mom and pop shops and currently have long-term leases. Four Aces Restaurant recently vacated the premises as a result of a court action taken against it by the HDFC for uncollected rent, so one commercial unit is currently vacant. 
in view of the fact that the required maintenance fees have not been raised for many years before the 5% increase and in the, the collection rates are low, sufficient funds have not been available to meet operating expenses and other obligations. Therefore, the property became eligible for TPT. Realizing they were in danger of foreclosure, the shareholders worked out a plan to help save their building. The shareholders have selected a new board. They have been working towards paying back taxes and recently entered into a payment agreement with DEP for the arrears. The HDFC will also enter into a voluntary repair agreement to address outstanding hou uh, housing code violations and needed repairs. No subsidy is being provided and no preservation loan is needed at this time as there are reserves in the building and along with timely collection of maintenance fees, the fund will continue to grow. In an effort to help maintain continued affordability and stability in the building, HBD is for the council seeking tax uh, benefits retroactive to 2011 for a term of 40 years that will coincide with a regulatory agreement and also mandates annual maintenance increases among other requirements such as hiring a third party manager. Approval of tax exemption will facilitate removal of 721 Van Sicklin Avenue HDFC from consideration as a candidate of round 10 of the third party transfer program allowing for long term home ownership by the shareholders. We can answer any questions that you might have. I'd like to turn to uh, Council Member Inez Barron for a statement and any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the panel for coming. And just to briefly share information about this building, it is a building in my district, not far, in fact, from where I live. It's a substantial building, and you've heard the description of what the apartments are that are there. So the management company that they have was perhaps not as effective as it should have been during the time that they've been there. And as you've indicated, they did not have the collections coming in because they were not having the required increases in the maintenance. So they fell into this state where they owed the city quite a bit of money. And they were placed, they are, as has been said, an HDFC, and they were placed in the TPT program. Previously, my predecessor, my husband, Charles Barron, worked with HPD about 12 years ago to assist another housing development that was in a similar state to work on getting themselves out of that position so that when they came to a position of uh, demonstrating their ability to manage themselves, they were able to become the shareholders themselves. In this instance, we did not think that it was fair that people who have been paying regularly and are in fact presently shareholders should lose all of the money that they have invested. So the board was reconstituted, they came together, they organized themselves, uh, they allowed people to forego some of the uh, more recent uh, transactions that they were negligent on, but they did come to an agreement and they have now established the opportunity for the present residents to reestablish themselves and maintain their shareholder, maintain the ability to own their apartments. And we feel that's very important. We know that this is an area, as is across the city, being targeted by those who want to gentrify it and displace people who have lived through the hard times. And we felt that that was not um, a just situation. And I'm very pleased to say that HPD was very, very responsive. They sent people to the meetings that the shareholders had. They gave us a lot of direction, a lot of information. And there was also a legal aid lawyer who worked tirelessly at no cost to help the tenants understand all that they had to do. There was an extensive list that they had to gather of all kinds of documents in order to qualify for consideration and they've gathered all of that and done all that. And so that's why we're here now at this juncture so that they can be approved for Article 11. I wholeheartedly support them. I continue to impress upon them, listen, we're here now, we're not gonna come back here again. We've got to be able to maintain what we say we're going to do or we'll be in a worse situation going forward. So I wholeheartedly support the program and I do thank land use, HPD, and the lawyer and those residents that are there understanding the opportunity that they have and fighting to maintain their ability to have ownership. I want to uh, thank Council Member uh, Barron for her hard work and uh, based on her uh, statement, also your predecessor, uh, it sounds like you have 
pretty activist members here fighting for you. I'm going to ask just some uh, questions that I try to ask uh, all about every single project. So currently there's 21 who have home ownership, uh, 15 that are rentals. Uh, will those 15 rentals remain rentals or will they be co converted into cooperative ownerships? Uh, we are not entirely sure at this time. I can't say that every one of them will be, but the building is interested in um, once units become available to push towards home ownership. What is the AMI cap for uh, people who want to uh, be, what will the maintenance be tied to? Uh, is there a situation where somebody might be required to pay more maintenance than they can afford to pay? And uh, if somebody sell, sells their cooperative unit, are there any limitations on who they can sell to? Right, so the program allows for um, an income cap up to 120% of AMI that will be written into the regulatory agreement once it's finalized. And uh, how much will maintenance be? All right, so maintenance is the way that this building operates. They meet as a board and they decide on maintenance increases. Um, currently, the maintenance for one bedroom recently went up from $440 to $462. Um, it's $556.50 for a two bedroom and $651 for the one for the one three bedroom. And uh, so how much can they sell a unit for to somebody who's at 120% of AMI or below? So the regulatory agreement that they have agreed to sign on to in exchange for the Article 11 tax abatement. Um, for this year, the one bedroom, the max would be uh, 358, roughly 358,000, uh, 424,000 for the two bedroom, and 491,000 for the three bedroom. But I want to stress that in the meeting I had with the shareholders uh, back in December, they raised concerns that that was too much. And we explained to them at the meeting that that is just a cap, it's a ceiling. If a building decides that they want to further restrict the income caps, they can vote on it as a board. And uh, if a tenant were to sell and gain a windfall per hands of 391 or 400,000 or more dollars, do they get all of it or would the building take some or would HPD take some to recoup taxes or, or how does that work? So buildings, um, once again, that was something that the shareholders raised. They were concerned about um, their ability to impose a flip tax. And so the regulatory agreement gives them the power to impose, to impose the flip tax to what they would want it to be. Um, in some instances, it's 70-30. Um, if they want to make it deep, if they want to make it where it's 80-20, they can. But it's up to the board. They can decide what they want their flip tax to be. But nothing comes to HPD, it's, oh, it's just between the person selling and the HDFC. Sure, so just full disclosure, uh, I'm an attorney and attorneys tend not to ask questions we don't know the answers <laughs> to. Uh, so in other HDFC arrangements, in fact every other one there is part of the regulatory agreement, uh, maintenance is tied to a specific AMI as well as having specific uh, provisions for sale of requiring 95% of uh, house uh, of co-ops flipped in the first five years or something that that fee goes back to the cooperative to help maintain it. So is this different, how is this different than the other projects that we've seen at this committee? And so the other projects, projects that we brought before the committee were models more along the ANCP program. These are till, these are till buildings mm -hmm. that remain till buildings, slightly different. Okay, um, that, that is helpful. And so I guess, is there a reason why we couldn't bring some of the ANCP provisions over to this building? And so this is a first hearing and I, I will uh, turn it, I, I, I imagine that there will be ongoing conversations between the board and HPD and, and Council Member Barron to ensure that the tenants who are staying here are incentivized to stay there, that folks aren't sitting there being confronted with the option of Three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars of windfall, and whether it's creating a, a thirty or forty or fifty or sixty or seventy percent 
uh, flip tax voluntarily by the co-op board voting on it now or what have you, um, and if we can just work with the HPD to make sure that some of the ANCP incentives remain a part of these conversions too. We'll certainly take it back to the agency and discuss it. Okay. Are there any members of the public uh, who would like to testify on this matter? Uh, seeing none, we will now close the hearing on land use item 59. Our next hearing is on land use uh, item, land use items 55 through 57, the Park Haven, Park Haven rezoning. HPD seeks approval for an urban development action area project, AUDAP, designation project approval and disposition of city owned property. It also seeks a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from R6 to R7D with a C1-4 commercial overlay and a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing MIH option two. These actions will facilitate the development of an 11 story mixed use building with 169 units of affordable housing, fresh food supermarket and a community facility space in the district of council member Ayala. Under the existing R6 zoning, there is no specific height limit. The height is governed by sky exposure planes unless a quality housing program is elected. The floor area ratio can range for height factor buildings from 7.78 to 2.43. Under the proposed R7D rezoning, a residential floor area ratio of 5.6 would be permitted. For the MIH developments under C1-4, a floor area ratio of uh, 2.0 would be allowed for commercial uses. The height limit under R7D with a qualifying ground floor and MIH would be 115 feet. Uh, we will now open the public hearing on land use items uh, 55 through 57 and just the uh, plain language version of this. Uh, the city has a bunch of uh, vacant lots that have served as pretty much parking uh, for at least I think the past decade or more. The community has wanted to do something uh, with this property which is incidentally right adjacent to People's Park and so the city is proposing to uh, uh, turn the property over uh, to a developer at uh, little to no cost, most likely a dollar. And in addition, uh, we would like to increase how much you can build there uh, by a more than half. So we're more than doubling uh, what you can build there. Uh, we're also putting a cap uh, saying you can't really go higher than 115 feet. Uh, we're also making sure that this developer uses a fresh incentive to build a food supermarket. And uh, that looks like the, oh, and the last but not least is we're gonna require that uh, when all of this expires and some of it will eventually expire, mandatory inclusionary housing will require that a certain percentage of these units remain affordable uh, forever. Uh, so I think those are the key items. Uh, and uh, hold on. I will now ask the, uh, and I'll call the first panel. We have Ted Weinstein uh, from HPD, Lacey Tauber, formerly of the council, now of HPD, uh, Desiree uh, Andre Point of the Community Builders, uh, Susan M of the Community Builders, uh, and Eileen Torres of Bronx Works, and Betty Ann Tomason of Bronx Works, uh, and now the council will swear you in. Please state your names. My name is Ted Weinstein. <laughs> you gotta talk into the mic, yeah. Uh, Lacey Tauber, Government Affairs at HPD. Desiree Andropov, Community Builder. Eileen Torres, Bronx Works. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. You may begin. Okay. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, land use uh, numbers 55, 56, and 57 are related ULERB actions seeking zoning amendments. 
establishment of a mandatory inclusionary housing area, UDAP designation, project and disposition approval for nine city-owned sites located at 345 St. Anne's Avenue in the Mott Haven section of Bronx Council District 8, a uh, project known as Park Haven. Two privately owned lots adjacent to the development site at Block 2268, lots 48 and 50, are included in the rezoning area, creating an assemblage of 11 lots forming the project area. The city-owned parcels are all vacant lots, some of which are currently used as parking for an adjacent church. Of the two privately owned parcels, lot 48 contains an active church and lot 50 contains a vacant five-story building. Park Haven will be developed through HPD's Extremely Low and Low Income ELLA program. Under the ELLA program, sponsors develop multifamily buildings in order to create low-income rental housing for families with a range of incomes from 30% to 60% of the area median income, or AMI. Projects may include a tier of units with rents targeted to households earning up to 100% of AMI. Subject to project underwriting, up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless families and individuals referred by the Department of Homeless Housing or other public agencies. The Park Haven project will have incomes capped at 80% of AMI. LU number 55 will facilitate the construction of an 11-story mixed-use building containing 169 units plus a superintendent's unit. There will be a mixture of unit types including 43 studios, 55 one-bedrooms, 45 two-bedrooms, and 26 three-bedrooms at varying income tiers distributed throughout the building. Rents will be established with tiers affordable to families earning from 30 to 60 percent of the area median income, AMI, with up to 20 percent of the units affordable to families with incomes up to 80 percent of AMI. The rents are anticipated to range from $462 for a studio to $1,888 for a three-bedroom apartment. That's 40 percent and 80 percent AMI, respectively. Formerly homeless households, referred by DHS and other city agencies, will pay up to 30% of their income as rent. The building will be energy efficient and amenities will include a gym, indoor recreation area, outdoor recreation area, a tenant community garden on the 10th and 11th terrace, rooftop activity space, laundry adjacent to the outdoor terrace, a grocery store selling fresh fruits and vegetables, active design principles, and workforce development services offered by Bronx Works. Additionally, the ground floor will contain approximately 14,297 square feet of commercial space, designated to be a fresh supermarket which is traveling as a separate unit. Additionally, the project will have approximately 7,300 square feet of community facility space for use by the residents and members of the community, and approximately 8,820 square feet of open space to be utilized as recreation space and a tenant community garden. LEU number 56 seeks an amendment to the zoning map to rezone the project area from an R6 district to an R7D district with a C14 overlay district. Under the R6 existing zoning, the maximum FAR for residential use is 2.43 and 4.8 maximum for community facility. The proposed R7D C14 will allow an increase in the FAR for residential use to 4.2 and 4.0 for community facility. It will also allow a maximum FAR of 2.0 for commercial use. LU number 57 seeks a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one. The number of permanently affordable units under MIH will be 39, along with the MIH designated units, HPD will require an additional 15% of permanent affordable units, bringing the anticipated total number of permanently affordable units to approximately 62. In order to facilitate construction of the Park Haven project, HPD is before the planning subcommittee request, requesting approval of land use numbers 55, 56, and 57. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the project team to give the more in-depth description of the project. <coughs> Hi, my name is Desiree Andropon. I'm with the Community Builders. Uh, well, sorry to interrupt. Do we have testimony from uh, the builder, Community Builders and Bronx Works? Any written testimony? Oh, um, I have the written. Can you hand out the one paper? Mm -hmm. Should I read that? And, and 
just as a reminder to HPD, uh, as with other committees, we would prefer that that written testimony that that testimony from applicants be uh, written. And for for members of the public, you can go to council.nyc.gov uh, to get copies of the testimony that's been submitted. You can also see uh, transcripts from the hearing as well as appearance cards. Uh, You may continue. Uh, HPD issued a request for proposals in 2015 for development of seven contiguous city owned vacant lots in the corner of 142nd Street and St. Anne's Avenue in Mott Haven. TCP provided a response to the RFP and was designated as developer in January 2016. For this project, Community Builders has partnered with Bronx Works. It's a local nonprofit organization dedicated to helping individuals and families improve their economic and social well-being and has been deeply involved in the South Bronx community since 1972. Bronx Works for this project will provide on-site support services and workforce development training. Uh, on-site support services will be inside the residential portion of the building and the workforce development training program that they currently operate will relocate to the site um, and be available from the street. The proposed development will be a newly constructed 11-story, 181,605 square foot mixed income, mixed use building with 170 units and two ground floor leased spaces. The ground floor programming is expected to include Fresh Foods Grocer under the city's Fresh program and a workforce development program operated by Bronx Works that I previously described. The building mix has studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms, and will also include a supers unit. So there are 169 residential rented units and one supers unit. 80% of the units will be low income, LIHTC or low income housing tax credit eligible units that are at or below 60% of AMI, and 20% of the units will be affordable to middle income residents earning 80 to 100% of AMI. Of the total residential units, 50 units will be designated as permanently supportive housing for chronically homeless families with children under the age of 18 during the time of intake. And Bronx Works will provide on-site support services to these families through a New York State uh, ESHI grant. So uh, that grant has been awarded. The newly constructed building will be highly energy efficient and is expected to meet passive house standards. The building will also meet Enterprise Green Community standards as required by HPD. Other building features include solar panels, rooftop activity track, tenant community garden, a gym on-site above grade laundry, indoor recreation areas and outdoor landscape recreation areas to encourage active and healthy living for the residents. The ground floor commercial and community uses will be centered around an open residential lobby and central staircase as well as an open air corridor adjacent to the residential entry. Perfect. Uh, over to uh, Councilman Varela for any questions or statements. So I'm Eileen Torres. I'm the Executive Director of Bronx Works. We did not prepare written testimony. I mean, we, so I don't, if you'd like us to testify without that, we're happy to do so. Um, we don't have a copy of what we will be testifying. Did you show up intending to testify? Um, yes. Please do. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Eileen Torres. I'm the executive director of Bronx Works. And Bronx Works, um, as Desiree mentioned, is a multi-service organization that has been uh, based in the southern part of the Bronx since 1972. We've been operating shelters for homeless families since 1992 um, and providing benefits assistance since the inception of the organization, since the founding. Um, so for this particular project for Park Haven, um, we would be uh, providing supportive uh, services to 50 supportive units for chronically, for formerly chronically homeless families. 
Um, it includes inten intensive case management at the school services for the children. Um, also cr uh, provides, uh, we will also provide financial literacy services for the residents. Um, we will serve as their representative payee for the families, thereby ensuring that we pay the rent so that they won't become homeless again um, and making sure that they're stably housed. Um, we will also relocate all our workforce development programs that are currently at a different location. And my colleague, Betty Ann Tamazar, can give a full description of the workforce development programs in the that will be in the facility. So thank you, Eileen. Good afternoon, my name is Betty Ann Tamesa and I'm the Department Director for Workforce Development at Bronx Brooks. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the City Council's Subcommittee of Planning, Dispositions and Concessions for allowing me to testify on the Park Haven project. We at Bronx Brooks Workforce Development Department are very excited about relocating um, the four programs currently housed in the department to 142nd Street and St. Anne's Avenue. The four programs are the Jobs Plus Program, which serves NYCHA public housing residents in Batanzas, Cortland, Moore, and Melrose Houses. The Strong Fathers, Strong, uh, Stronger Families Program that services custodial and non-custodial fathers. The Young Adult Internship Program that services youth 16 to 24. And the Family Self-Sufficiency Program that services HPD Section 8 voucher holders. Um, collectively, these programs provide job readiness, occupational training services, job placement, parenting and healthy relation, relationship classes, and access to benefits and financial counseling. In 2007, we served 1,271 unique individuals. Of that number, we assisted 908 of those individuals with job readiness services, 595 individuals with job search, 490 individuals with occupational skills training in OSHA general industry, OSHA construction, scaffolding, flagger, eight hours, 16 hour and fire guard certifications. We also assisted 419 individuals with financial counseling services, inclusive of helping them to decrease debt and increase services, credit scores, et cetera. Um, least but definitely not last, we um, assisted 385 individuals to gain employment in various sectors with companies the agency has ongoing relationships with. To demonstrate the agency's commitment to those they serve, Bronx Works is one, if not the largest employer of workforce development participants. Thank you for allowing me to speak this option. Now to Council Member Ayala. Good afternoon, thank you for submitting testimony today. Uh, this project is a little, was actually a project that was initiated prior to my uh, becoming the council member for this district, um, but I know that my predecessor worked really hard um, to negotiate it. I have a lot of concerns about this project. I'm always excited to see housing coming to uh, my district, especially in the South Bronx, where I know that we desperately need affordable housing. Um, when families are constantly, you know, being pushed out day in and day out uh, because they're overburdened with, uh, with rent. Um, I think that we're kind of missing an opportunity and in, in this site because it is a city owned lot. I think that that gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of the, uh, the level of affordability that we're providing to this community. And so I have some concerns and I'm hoping to kind of work through them uh, today and, and maybe follow up with some conversation later. But I, I do have some questions. Um, could you tell me what the, uh, the length of the regulatory agreement for the HPD financing is? is 60 years okay now this project proposes to include a 30 percent set aside for formerly homeless families can you explain HRA and HPD's procedures for matching homeless applicants with available units in this project and can you confirm that HRA does not consider community preference or last known address uh, I believe our um, operating funding funding source Ishai uh, is uh, funded through the state OTDA. Um, and we've had several conversations internally about how we're going to draw families uh, for this particular site. Um, and so there, we have asked this question internally. One of the things that we were hoping to do and, and we're really hoping to address the issue of children in schools um, in a school district and living in shelter outside of the district. So what we were hoping to do is target 
families, chronically homeless families in shelter that have children in this community's school district, which I believe is school district seven. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, th that's our goal. <laughs> uh, we don't know exactly what the rules are going to be and how those, what those funds require in terms of how the residents are drawn. Is that, that's correct? That's correct, um, and we have been trying to obtain feedback from HRA and DHS concerning this. Um, I just want to sort of give you the, uh, uh, the fuller name for Ishai, because I think, um, so it's the Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative grant that we've been able to secure already for this facility. And those are operating funds to provide the on-site services. Um, this is, so HPD, what is your policy around uh, housing families that are coming from homeless shelters? Is, is there a policy? I mean, I know this is fairly new. We're now starting to set aside units for formerly um, homeless individuals, but is there a pol an internal policy that you use? Um, it's, it's the, yeah, the, the referrals come to us uh, through the department, as I was describing the testimony, uh, the Department of Homeless Housing, and um, I believe there is a, a borough preference expressed by uh, folks in that system, but um, it's through HRA, so I'm not really prepared to speak to that. I'd have to get okay. HRA. And you can't confirm that HRA doesn't com uh, consider community preference? Not on the district level, no. Okay. Um, HPD's ELLA term sheet has two standard options, and this project is currently slated for ELLA option two. Have you looked at the viability of ELLA option one? Um, we have, uh, I think when we originally submitted the proposal, um, we wanted to try to provide a, a critical mass of families uh, that could be served on site through a service program. So we did, our, all of our focus has been on the option two with the 30% formerly homeless. So um, I think in our original proposal we had 32 units. We've been able, because um, we've been able to upzone and include the MIH and the FRESH, um, we have been able to now include 50 units. And so there is some critical mass of, uh, of, of families that we would need in order to be able to support on-site services. So that was our rationale for uh, the 30% homeless. I just, so my frustration with this project is that, you know, listen, I am um, in favor of set-asides for formerly uh, homeless families. I, that's not in question. But I think that in this community where we desperately need affordable housing, that this project does not do enough to afford the people that actually live there that are being priced out an opportunity to apply for units that they can afford. This is the poorest congressional district. And we're setting aside 5% of the units at 40% of the AMI and 5% of the units at 50% of the AMI because we're saying, well, we're offering 30% to homeless families, but these homeless families are not necessarily homeless families that may or may not reside in the South Bronx. But at the same time, we have families that do live there that are being, you know, that are, that are going into shelter because they're being priced out. So I, it just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and I think that I would strongly, you know, encourage that um, you go back and, 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 and have a conversation because I think that there needs to be a more equitable distribution of the units that actually you know meets the needs in this community so that we're servicing families that really need it but we're also taking into account that there are families that live there that need it as well and I don't think that these numbers do that for me and I don't think that they do that for the families of the South Bronx and so I would again strongly urge you to kind of to go back and I'm happy to have further discussion about that but that's really where I am right now I, I have a lot of concerns about this um, this is a city owned you know lot so it, it, it should offer us a lot more flexibility to do this to go deeper and to make more units uh, permanently affordable and so um, you know that that is my position in regards to that but I, I wanted to also ask um, how much of the of the projected slate uh, how much of this project slate is slated to receive uh, how much is a sorry how much is the project slated to receive in city subsidies and what percent of the total project cost is this The 
subsidies from the city, uh, HPD specifically, is $23.8 million. And that's approximately 30% of the development cost. Okay. And then HDC provides a loan of $11 million. 50,000, and that's <coughs> approximately 14% okay. of the funding. I would just add that these are estimates, and sometimes the financials will <coughs> change before the project closes. Okay. So given that this project is going to receive a significant amount of taxpayer subsidy, is there a plan to ensure that the permanent jobs created are good jobs that pay prevailing wage? Uh, I actually did look at the um, the impact of prevailing wage mm -hmm. on the on the performance so what happens is um, the increase in the operating costs by paying those those higher wages um, reduces the amount of supportable debt on the project so for this particular project I just briefly plugged in what the underwriting standards are for the city's mm -hmm. housing finance agency HDC and that change came to about six hundred and fifty thousand dollar gap, w it reduced our supportable first mortgage by $650,000. So um, I know my understanding is that these ELLA type projects, these very low income projects, because they have such a, a very low cash flow, they often can't support prevailing wage operating jobs. Um, that said, it is something that we can look at, but it does have a, a real impact on the financials of the project and the financial feasibility of the project. Okay, I would appreciate it if you could look look into that a little bit further. Um, if you could tell us what are the fees, uh, what fees will the developer earn on this project? The estimated developer fee is 12.8%, comes to $10 million. We are sharing our fee with our partner, Bronx Works. And I just wanted to also mention, I don't think I said this earlier, but the Community Builders is a nonprofit affordable housing developer, and our Bronx Works, our partner, is also a nonprofit. So these fees go back into the communities where we work, um, and I, I just wanted to make sure that that was, uh, that was something that everybody understood. I appreciate that. What percentage of the 12.8 is going to be split with Bronx Works? We have an agreement right now to split 10% with Bronx Works. Right, and so I, I do want to emphasize that this is the first agreement that we have with any developer who's been willing to share any fees with us without us guaranteeing any part of the project mm -hmm. or taking any on any risk. Um, and so all of those fees would then, once collected, would go right back into all the services that we provide, which in turn then goes back to the community. Actually, I had a question for you, Eileen. Don't put the, so you mentioned um, that Bronx Works would become the designated payee for families coming in. What does that mean? So for um, families who uh, receive Social Security, um, you know, SSI payments, what we usually do, at, we have another supportive housing facility that we operate. Um, it's a voluntary arrangement with them. The, the family, the head of household, would then agree to have us serve as their representative payee. So there's an account that we have set up that comes in, so it's earmarked for that family member, and then what we do is we make sure that we pay their rent first, and then they, we allocate. We have a spending plan with them that we allocate for the month, and so then we give them the money throughout that month. So it's to make sure that we're paying the rent on time, um, and we're paying any, any expenses that they may have that they need, so that we can make sure that they stay housed. Okay, I, th I think I was a little bit confused. I, th I didn't understand in your testimony that it was voluntary, so that raised a little bit of a red flag for me. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited again for the possibility of affordable housing. I just need to make sure that this is affordable housing that is in the best interest of all of the parties involved, and I think that um, there needs to be further conversation. We can definitely look into that. I think there are some. Um, ways that we can approach it and maybe uh, come to something that can uh, keep our, our the critical yeah. mass of the formerly homeless units, but also meet some of the lower income requirements. So we'll go back and do some work and see what we can I'd do. I'd appreciate that, okay. thank you. Right, so um, I just want to reemphasize a little bit of what um, Desiree was saying, which is the way we're, be, we're able to have such intensive case management on site 
is by having a basic minimum of 50 units within that facility. Um, if we don't have those 50 units, it's not financially feasible to run a program. So just you know, want to sort of make sure that I made that point. No, I, un I understand that, but we, we're running in the city, we're running out of city-owned lots to build on, right? And so we're building higher mm -hmm. and higher. Mm -hmm. Here we have a unique you know, opportunity to do that and to do that well. And while I appreciate the efforts being made as a formerly homeless you know, person myself, um, to house formerly ho homeless families, I also have to take into consideration that I have families that are, ex that are existing families that live in this community that are being priced out and becoming homeless every single day and that we're not doing enough to build affordable options for them to apply for. And this project has nine units that could possibly maybe, right? Again, we're in the poorest congressional district, so I will count the nine that are 40% and only half of that. There's, there's not half of those units are have a community preference attached to it. So. You know, I, it just doesn't work for me. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Ayala. Uh, so it is. I, I I think these are some of the concerns that I, I know we sh I also shared when we were in discussions. And if I can just uh, add on to it just um, a little bit. So I guess the. Uh, going to take it in a slightly different direction, which is just how many uh, lots are being merged as part of this? Nine. <laughs> Nine. Are there any other additional lots that are unimproved and do not have any structures on them? There were two adjacent lots on the 142nd Street side uh, that are not developed that appear to be used for storage. They're privately owned lots. What kind and of? Nine city owned lots. Those two lots are not city owned. And, and what kind of storage is on those lots? Is it, uh, is it like very clean and it just has a storage bin on it? Or does it appear that uh, there are random parts of auto parts and boat parts and other items just uh, strewn around uh, lots? It's, it's not a high life for the neighborhood. Oh, okay. So um, now, so you've got these, this whole row of empty lots. Some of them are owned by the city, so bad on us. There are these two empty lots that are owned by somebody else, bad on them. What, what happened to those lots? They've been privately owned and there was no indication. After, um, uh, after the community builders was selected through a very competitive process, uh, they did try to reach out to the owners of those lots, but were unsuccessful. Uh, did you actually, so, so the unsuccessful means, uh, so who reached out to whom and, and what happened? Community builders tried to track the, down. They, the they are right here. Yes, <laughs> we tried to track down the owners. We were not successful in reaching them or, or ha coming to any discussions about acquiring the sites. Uh, so who, who are the owners? Do you know? Or I don't know that information. Are they individuals? Me. Are they LLCs? Yeah, it, they were LLCs. Okay. Uh, and so how long have we been trying to do a project here as a city? Many years. So I believe in some of our conversations we talked about, like this goes back to 1998, yes. possibly? Yes. Uh, how long would it take for the city to use eminent domain to say this location is a, a blight? We are literally doing urban renewal, the purpose for which eminent domain should be used, not for stadiums, uh, not for making money, but to actually just deal with urban blight, what is, uh, how long does it take for that? I, I mean, I think it takes longer than we have to talk about in the context of the approval of this project. And I think, you know, we, we hear what you're saying about wanting a priority for us to look at this, you know, moving forward, but it's not something that I think makes sense for us to address right now. I mean, it's a, it, it's a very complicated process. It needs buy-in at all levels of the administration. You know, we, we're in an affordable housing crisis and we wanna move forward with this project as quickly as we can. For much of that time period, especially the more recent years, mm -hmm. um, the city policy was not to acquire more of the city policy was to dispose of properties. Um, and so, well, large amounts of properties were acquired through urban renewal plans I mean, that's one of the differences that where you know, the South Bronx certainly had numerous urban renewal plans that were adopted 
which covered large amounts of land, large territories, not just two small lots. And in, in nine lots, two lots would have been a 20% increase. Uh, so I guess I would like HPD to come back to us, and I don't want to see another project coming before us where there's literally vacant lots that are being used for auto storage, which I'm almost sure is a violation of the law. I don't think you can just use a residential lot and use it for industrial storage. Uh, so I'm curious why DEP has not issued violations and why HPD possibly has not issued violations, uh, but I would prefer not to see that again. And I would also like to know from community builders, is there a way to build this in such a way that if HPD were to commit to moving forward with eminent domain, perhaps the owner might be interested in working with you such that either we could uh, get it done as part of this deal or that your project could be built in such a way so as those two lots became available, you could extend properly and seamlessly. We can certainly look at that, for sure. Uh, on our part, I would say we hear you on projects moving forward from here. Um, as Ted said, it's a very different context now than it was in the 90s when we first started looking at this lot, so, you know. Uh, similarly, there is a uh, People's Park, which will be available, that's currently used by the community. Uh, anytime I see a developer coming in, profit, for profit or nonprofit, uh, I always wonder about their commitment to the community and whether or not uh, we can get a conservancy working with our council member Ayala or others to uh, make sure that there's folks not only caring for your own outdoor space, but for the adjacent space that your tenants will hopefully use. We uh, are definitely going to be providing um, uh, fencing around the space that's currently there, parks uh, approved fencing. Um, and our goal is very much to make the back of the building attractive to the park. Uh, so when you are looking at the back of the building, you can actually see the back of the building from the corner on the next block. So we, there, again, going back to the um, concerns about cash flow on these types of projects, there is not a tremendous amount of cash flow in these low-income projects. So adding on, um, adding on any kind of maintenance or any kind of program for maintaining the park would significantly increase the cost of the project and change the financials. One thing that we are doing, we've heard a lot of concerns from the community about safety in People's Park, especially in that back corner. And we are working, um, uh, Bronx Works has former law enforcement on staff that, ma that manages their security uh, across their properties and, and places where they operate. So one of the things that we've talked about with them is how do we position our security cameras and the security uh, procedures that we have on site to make sure that we are um, maybe hopefully making that uh, area of the park a little safer. And having eyes on the park too, uh, just having a pre physical presence there, um, I think will actually help the safety and improve that park significantly. In conversations with Councilmember Brial, we were discussed the uh, absence of uh, supermarkets throughout different parts of the neighborhood. Uh, the fresh grocery on the ground floor, 7,500 square feet at grade, 6,700 below grade, but that won't be available to customers. It'll be available for storage, which makes for a very small supermarket. Is there any opportunity to make additional space available for the grocery and any commitment to making sure that the prices are affordable? We are definitely exploring um, how we can provide a little more space to the grocer. They have asked for us to try to find more space, so we have um, been looking at how we can accommodate more space in on that ground floor. Uh, that is something that we're looking at. Um, I will tell you that the rent, uh, the, the FRESH program actually provides incentives not just to uh, developer, but also to grocery operators. So the grocer will uh, receive real estate tax benefits that will flow through the property to, to them as, as uh, tenants. Uh, and I believe there are some sales tax incentives. Um, so, so the operator actually has incentives to, um, that, are, that are helping him keep uh, prices affordable. But if you'd like, I can talk with him and make sure that it's right, on board Absolutely, that. It's, it's up to the <laughs> local member and you and uh, 
the, the supermarket just about making sure that folks can actually use it as a supermarket. And I guess uh, you may have caught my remarks on the way in about being slightly miffed about a park. In my district, you can look in, and uh, but if you want to step foot in, it's $180 an hour. Uh, so I guess one question is, will your public space be available and open to your neighbors, to, to other uh, cultural or religious institutions in the neighborhood, or to folks mm -hmm. who are on the other side of that fence who say, that, that looks like a pretty garden, I'd love to participate or, or have a role versus just being stuck at those bars staring right. in. <laughs> we have discussed um, how we can make that open space uh, uh, between the park and the, and the building entrance, um, how we might be able to use that open space in a way that uh, invites the community in for certain programming. So we've talked about, um, I know there's a uh, I, Eileen, you guys have a, a fresh food market, right? right? So and that's um, so. I did want to. I've been trying to jump out, <laughs> but no, I'm sorry <laughs> about that. So just going back to the park, um, one of the things we have a very, very strong presence in Mott Haven, and one of the things that we actually are the lead partner for is our healthy and livable Mott Haven, um, and in that. For that project, we've actually done a tremendous job in activating St. Mary's Park, which is right across the street um, from this, from where this facility will be. We are hoping that we would be able to do something very, very similar to People's Park, um, and so that is something that we have on our, you know, on our list of items of wishful funding that we'd like to be able to get, so we can expand what we currently do in St. Mary's Park and have that in People's Park. Um, we also have. Um, we also have opened a farm stand in front of Belvis, which is right near this, where this facility will be as well, that offers fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables then to the community, and we'd like to ex be able to expand that too. Belvis is a health center, it doesn't Right. I, I'd like to note we've been joined by Council Member Chaim Deutsch, uh, and just in terms of the developers, uh, what is the makeup in terms of uh, minority and women as executives, uh, in terms of for development, uh, will you be using MWBE certified uh, contractors, architects, other service providers, and in terms of those who are doing the work, uh, will those people receive uh, a wage that is commensurate with the area norm? Will those people be getting health benefits so that they get injured, that they can go to, sounds like there's a health provider across the street and have that covered? And in the event that that injury means that they can't keep working, will they have disability insurance? Um, so for, for both doing the work to build it and then operate it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll start with the um, on-site. Uh, there will be approximately 70 full-time and part-time jobs at this um, property after it's built. Uh, that includes uh, workforce development um, folks that are already currently employed in, a, in another location. We will have grocery, uh, new employees for the grocery. They will have approximately 30 employees full and part-time. The support services that Bronx Works will provide, will have, there will be nine, uh, nine um, jobs there. And then we expect to have five, at least five full-time folks on board. We are not going to prop manage this property, uh, but internally as an organization, we have a minimum wage of $15 an hour. That's our minimum across all of our properties. And we will, we expect that the property manager who will be working um, with us on this project will follow those guidelines as well. Also as an organization, we have um, hiring goals that we internally implement. These are not things that are required by um, a municipality or uh, or any kind of funding. These are these are our own internal requirements. So we our our goals are to have 30% MBE, 10% WBE, 5% DBE, another 5% for small businesses, 3% um, for DBE, and where required, uh, Section 3, um, which is not a requirement here, but targeting 10%. Um, we. Are, have already had conversations with our contractor, who is Monadnock, about meeting these requirements. Um, they have provided us with 
an outline of how they uh, approach this. Um, and I, I, I have that if you'd like it, but I believe that he's provided that, uh, Greg Balso, in testimony earlier in the month um, or last month. But I can, I, can, I can provide that to you for how they're going to achieve these. Testimony at City Planning Commission or no, this is the I first hearing at the council? I believe it was at the council, but I can find out on another project. But I can find out and I can get you the information as so well. So they may have testified on another project. Yeah. So I, I just want to say in terms of Bronx Works, um, you know, we have approximately 850 employees uh, and we are committed to hiring those who are from the Bronx um, and refre reflect the diversity of those residents that we serve. I myself was born in the South Bronx, um, so it starts from the very top to everyone uh, you know, below. And so um, at last count when we did our survey, which admittedly was probably at this point about three years ago, 70% of our employees were born and raised in the Bronx and currently still live in the Bronx. So just to give you sort of an idea of what our commitment is. Also with workforce development, the, um, the department itself, we have hired in a number of our own participants who are part of those programs to serve in various capacities throughout the entire organization. Uh, there's still outstanding questions yep. in terms of uh, leadership. What I just asked. Yeah, yes, but I'd like to, you can give that to us in writing and I'll okay, turn that'd it be over great. to uh, <laughs> Council Member Salmanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Kalos. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge I have a relationship with Bronx Works. You do great work in my community, and um, it's, it's good to see that you are part of this project. Um, community builders, um, where are you based out of? We have offices here in New York City, in Chicago, D.C. Um, we operate in 14 states from the Mississippi River on east. The headquarters are in Boston. The company was founded in Boston. Okay, how many uh, how many developments have you developed in the in the Bronx? This will be our first. This will be your first. Okay. Um, so now, and, and the reason I bring that up is that you would understand my colleague's frustration. Uh, she's my neighboring colleague. We both have the same. Uh, we uh, represent the poorest congressional district in in the nation. And when I saw that. HPD was going to option two. I was really disappointed in seeing that. You know the needs of this community, HPD. You know that option two is unacceptable for our community. But yet, you would want to give this community option two and not provide any 30% AMI units to members of the community. And I would like you to please explain that to me. This was, oh, sorry. This was, as you know, this was the result of a RFP, a competitive process. And this is city-owned land, and that's what's most frustrating about this project. Right. They, um, there were 15 submissions in response to the RFP. It was very competitive. That's a very high number. Um, they obviously then varied a lot in terms of what they were proposing. Um, this was a project that, in many ways, is a very attractive project, um, but one of the things that it proposed was um, uh, doing its part to try to meet um, not just the affordable housing crisis, but also the homeless crisis. Um, and so there is, under our program, it's, it's right there on our term sheet, there are these two options of how to use ELLA, the low-income program. And uh, this was a project uh, proposal that was looking to try to meet both of our needs. Um, sometimes that's difficult um, because there's only so many units in a building. Uh, but the point here was that they were, they were able to get state funding through the SI program, um, which uh, was, again, unusual. Um, and so their willing interest and their willingness to try to address that need was something that we thought was worthwhile at this location. Not it's every, I mean, if I may, not, not every project has that. Not every project uh, would have that. Um, but one of the things that we do try to do is through the variety of sites that get developed through our programs, so each different project, different locations serve different needs. Some serve you know, some types of needs, some serve other types of needs, some serve all needs. This project, this was considered an opportunity to uh, try to serve the need of addressing the homeless crisis. So again, my frustration with wanting to address those needs always in poor communities. So you're telling me that you think it's appropriate for 169 units that only 18 units are 40 and 50% AMI? I'm sorry, so you have nine units 
which is 5% of the project at 40% AMI, and another nine units, which is another 5% of the project at 50% AMI. So you're telling me that in the poorest congressional district of the city, of, in, in, the, in the state, or in the nation, HBT thinks it's appropriate to only provide 10% of 169 units, which is 18 units, to 50 and 40% AMI and totally excluding the 30% AMI bracket. Again, it's this is a proposal. It's wrong. It's wrong. I, I, I understand what you're saying. It's wrong. And 40% of your units, which is 67 units at 60% AMI, and then 20% of your units at 80% AMI. I really encourage when you sit down, and another question, community builders. How many times have you met with my colleague on this project? We've met uh, with Councilmember Ayala once. Okay. And she's been in office. All right. Well, you know, I'm the new chair of the Land Use Committee, and I'm getting involved in every project that happens in the city of New York. And I will be working with my colleague, and I will support my colleague every way possible. And I've encouraged my colleague to really look into this in terms of changing the MIH to option one, and also changing the composition of the project to getting a mix and match, which gives, us a, which gives her a better opportunity mm -hmm. to negotiate what's appropriate for that community. We all know that 10% homeless set aside is what's mandatory in city projects. And what's frustrating is that HPD decided to use MIH option two at that and then go with the 30% homeless set aside, which gives my colleague zero units at 30% AMI. And that is wrong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to reiterate on behalf of HPD that, you know, we, we're, we're looking at, we've made a commitment already to go back and look at this. Um, what we really want to do is ensure, though, that we can keep um, enough of the homeless set aside to support the work of Bronx Works in this project. Um, I think that you know they they've let us know that they need a certain amount uh, in order to do this work and bring that benefit to the community, and that's something that we want to also prioritize here. But we absolutely hear you about the res the. Um, units for the residents in your community and it's something that we're going to look at and see if we can figure something out that works for both. And as the developer, we're equally committed to making sure that uh, we have something that works for the folks in the community itself. So it is something, I, I think there are some things that we could look at. We're, what is underwritten here, it follows the term sheet guidelines, but we can go back and look at how we can address some of the affordability issues that you have. So I believe there's a lot of outstanding questions uh, from the council member, from uh, the land use chair, and also from me uh, in the time that we have. I am hoping that HPD will uh, use its eminent domain powers to uh, reach out to the additional property owners to see if we can uh, free those additional spaces up. They may be the space we need for a larger fresh site. It may be the space we need to get to lower levels of affordability. I'm going to uh, excuse this panel. I'm going to recess uh, this hearing briefly so that we can uh, take a vote on two items that had previously been heard by this committee. And then we will resume on this very application. The first project we will vote on in is the special project loan for 165 West 80th Street application, land use item 41 in Councilmember Rosenthal's district in Manhattan. HPD seeks an urban development action area project, UDAP approval pursuant to section 6094 of the general municipal law and article 11, 40 year full tax exemption approval to section 577 of the private housing, housing finance law. 
These actions will facilitate the transfer and rehabilitation of 165 West 80th Street to the sponsor, which will purchase and redevelop the building under a special project loan program. The existing building currently contains 39 studio apartments, 15 of which are occupied. The sponsor will rehabilitate the building so that upon completion, the project will provide approximately 29 affordable cooperative dwelling units, 20 studios, 9 bedrooms, 9 one bedrooms, and 1 superintendent unit. The occupied units will be sold to the existing tenants who average at 65% of AMI for $250 per dwelling unit, and vacant units will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 120% of AMI. There is a uh, letter of support from Council Member Rosenthal. We will also be voting to approve land use items 42 and 43, the CUCS West 127th Street Support of Housing Application Council Member Perkins District in Manhattan. HPD seeks approval of the Urban Action Development Area Project, UDAF designation and project approval disposition, city-owned property and special permit to allow community facility floor area ratio to be applied to development to create supportive and affordable housing. These actions will facilitate the development of a 12-story community facility building with 34 units reserved for homeless adults and 36 units reserved for homeless families. All with on-site supportive housing, 46 units affordable to low-income individuals and families reserved for households earning 50 to 60 percent of AMI and one, in one superintendent unit. There will be a 30-foot outdoor landscaped rear yard with an outdoor patio. Other amenities include fitness room, laundry facility, computer room, teaching kitchen, lounge, community room, rooftop garden, and 24-hour security. Uh, Councilmember Perkins supports this project. I will now call for a vote in accordance with the recommendations of Councilmember Rosenthal and Perkins to approve land use items 41 through 43. Council, please call the roll. Chair Kalos. I vote aye. Councilmember Gibson. I vote aye. Councilmember Deutsch. Aye. By a vote of three in the uh, uh, three affirmative, zero negative, and no abstentions, the land use items are referred to the full land use committee. We will leave the vote open to the conclusion of the full hearing. I want to thank uh, our uh, capital uh, budget chair, uh, Vanessa Gibson, for making her way over and for the uh, chance to go early during the uh, parks hearing so I could get here and excuse you to your <laughs> next capital hearing. Uh, so thank you. Uh, turning back to uh, the land use items numbers 55, 56, and 57, I'd like to now call the uh, next panel. Uh, it appears that we only have uh, three members of the public testifying in this matter, uh, and we have a very large number of people who will be testifying on uh, the uh, WSF uh, FSH, uh, also colloquially referred to as Wishfish. Uh, so for this one, I'll be asking folks to limit testimony to five minutes on the following uh, public testimony. will last for about two minutes. Uh, so we have... Uh, Pastor uh, David Serrano uh, from the. Uh, Good morning, Serrano Jr. Uh, sorry, Pastor Serrano Jr. from the uh, adjacent church. Uh, we have uh, David Serrano, I imagine, Sr. from uh, the adjacent church. And we have uh, Mohan Matabik from 32BJ. Uh, each of you will have five minutes. Imagine that the 32 BJ testimony might be shorter and might not take up the full five minutes. So we'll start with them and uh, then we'll continue on to the remainder of the panel. Yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Mohan Matabik. I am a building service worker and a member of 32 BJ SEIU. I am here today testifying on behalf of my union. This project is going to create badly needed affordable housing in the Bronx. My union believes that new affordable housing can also create new good jobs. Jobs that pay wages that allow people to afford to put a roof over their head, save for retirement, and access health benefits. This should be the citywide standard. 
That is why we are urging the subcommittee to urge HPD and the community builders to commit to paying the industry standard prevailing wage for building service workers in the Bronx. My union and I understand how important new affordable housing is for this neighborhood. A good jobs commitment is an important step towards ensuring that this development truly benefits the Bronx. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for the 32BJ uh, person? Uh, just so, do you know whether or not the building service workers who will be working on this project will uh, be entitled to uh, any health benefits or any uh, retirement, uh, or is that not known at this time? It is not known yet at this time. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I, I support your cause, as I think you heard with some of my questions, and I will leave it to you to work with the local member and the developer on this. I'd like to excuse you from the panel if that is okay. You got it. Whoever would like to go first, please identify yourself. Feel free to scooch over. There's two microphones. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is David Serrano. I'm the pastor of Thessalonica Christian Church for the last 28 years. Um, but the church is, is serving that community for uh, 79 years. Uh, we have a lot of programs uh, for the community, but our building is too small. That's why in 1992, when I heard that the uh, uh, park department was gonna extend People's Park to the lot that we've been mentioned, uh, we did a proposal to the planning board uh, to let us use that land uh, to build a church and use our building as a community center. In uh, 1994, we, we received the answer after uh, meeting with the commissioner, Mr. Stein, uh, and he agreed with us to make what, what we call a swap. Uh, David Rosado was the assemblyman by that time, so uh, he got a land for the park and recreation that is located at uh, Round Place and 137. Uh, there's still a, a park uh, there. And uh, they agreed to, to make that swap. What they was gonna do, they was uh, uh, release the property to uh, HPD and uh, HPD start dealing with us to acquiring the property. Uh, and, and we start doing that. We start working on that. Uh, but uh, suddenly, um, there was located at, at Longwood Avenue in the Bronx. But suddenly, they moved to uh, 100 Gold Street. But we didn't know anything about it before they moved. They never said to us that they were going to move even though we was in the process to get the property. So when we find out that they move and we contact them, uh, what they said, Mr. Ted Weinstein uh, told us that they misplaced our records. Uh, so, you know, uh, they are our leaders, I believe that. So uh, I, I asked them what we gotta do. Well, you have to start the process all over again. Uh, we started the process all over again, uh, but until today, I didn't know if they found out our record. I don't know if they got them back, because I think that is a responsible department from the city of New York. At the moment that they get those files back, they were supposed to call me or, or send me a letter or a fax and let me know, we found your records. Let's continue with the process. They never did. So we have to start all over again. So by that time, uh, it was 2005, we got a company uh, called OPM, and we start doing uh, uh, you know, the project, and we finished with it. We presented to HPD, uh, and uh, we don't know what happened because they never called back. 
uh, they spoke to uh, our planning board representative, and he told Mr. Weissing, told uh, our member, go and tell the pastor that we rejected the plan. In the meantime, when we had the meeting with them, they liked the plan, they gave us a prize for the lot, um, they said that within a week we were supposed to receive the uh, Euler uh, number to continue the process. Until today, they never did. Um, so, you know, we, we keep, that was, that was my problem. I keep believing in what they were saying. Um, so we went, we, I called Mr. Ted Whiting, I told him, listen, uh, we want to do the right thing here what we are supposed to do now. Do, do you have some uh, developers that you can, uh, you can let us know who they are that work with you? Because we don't want to make the same mistake. Okay, he gave us three names. Uh, we went, we contacted them, and we chose Full Spectrum. Full Spectrum by that time uh, was working on a green uh, technology. So they were, they were high recommended. When I so, so I think you've got an, another person who can testify for the remainder of five minutes, and if you want to uh, either continue with the same testimony or make the, make the case. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you for everything you do in the community. Uh, David Serrano, Jr., uh, the son of this man here. Uh, I just wanted to... Um, I started working heavily with my father and in the community when I was about 21. And uh, I'm 45, I'll be 45 now. And so I've been in, in the South Bronx working in the community for uh, quite a few years. And uh, you know, we've helped people get over their addictions. Uh, we've helped families get back together. Uh, we've, been, we've had boots on the ground seeing what the community needs and seeing who the community is. And uh, honestly, I'm just here to, to voice or to reiterate some of the concerns that have already been expressed. I have trouble believing that somebody that isn't from here or, or from the South Bronx, right, who doesn't live there and, and see the people there and hug the people there and cry with the people there, how is it that they're qualified to know what our people need? How does that make sense to anybody unless all we're considering is money? If that's all that we're considering, then I'm going to be disappointed in the decisions that our city's making. If we're really concerned about the people, then we've got to look a little bit beyond that. I understand that dollars and cents, at the end of the day, they're relevant and they matter. But, you know, I, I agree. We have homeless people. We have homeless vets. We have single moms. We, we've got kids that are struggling, They're that are uh, involved in serious gangs that are not good for them. What are we going to do about that, right? A supermarket is not going to help any of those situations at all. Um, and, and so, you know, my concern and, and my plea is please let us just not look at uh, what is financially practical. Let's look at what our people need, the members of our community, the citizens of our city, what they need, not what's going to look good at the end of the day. Uh, you know, on someone's uh, resume, or, or uh, let's look at what our people need, what our citizens need, and let's try to address those concerns. Um, I, I really believe that the city is full of people of honor and integrity that at the end of the day just want to help the people of New York City. Um, and I think that has to begin by making sure that the people that are going to develop and build are from New York City. Uh, if someone has never walked down St. Anne's Avenue, if you've never purchased milk from the corner store, how are you going to tell me what it is that our people need there? Um, and sorry, I'm a preacher, so I get a little emotional. But the reality is I, I agree. I, I agree with our council members, right? How are we going to build something that is, in essence, ignoring the real needs of the people that live there? It, it seems to me that then there is another agenda. Uh, that, that doesn't have at its core the individuals that live in our city and on our streets right now. Thank you. Did you want to cede the remaining two minutes back to your father? Sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just want you to know that I've been working in that community for 28 years, like I said before. 
And I've been a liaison uh, in the uh, Rikers Island. Uh, I've been a liaison and the Board of President's Office uh, at the 4-0 present. Uh, I've been part of the uh, Community Council. I've been part of the uh, Community Board. Uh, uh, I've been working with Habitat of Humanity. Uh, so I've been working in that community for 28 years. Um, I'm here to say that I believe that the process that HPD used, it wasn't fair to us, to the church, to our community, it, it wasn't fair. Um, like uh, I how, told you- How was, so my under, did you bid on this as well? Yes, we did. So in terms of the, the uh, what your, your son had said in terms of what the community needs, how, what was your proposal versus the proposal that ended up getting selected. You want to answer that? Oh, we just we had a lot more community. We had a lot more community-oriented programming, um, after-school programs for the kids, uh, watching. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Daycare uh, for our yeah. single parents single that parents. are in in the neighborhood. Uh, housing for vets, which is a problem. Uh, you know, uh, helping to reform individuals that have been incarcerated and now are struggling to find work, uh, that's a problem, right? And so, uh, and, but again, I, I'm not sure that, that you, we can be aware of these problems unless we're walking the streets. And, and so I, uh, how many units of affordable housing were included in your proposal or don't, you don't have to? At the beginning, it was only 80 because of the zoning. But with the change of the zoning, we could do more than 150. So your proposal may have been a little bit more modest because you didn't include a zoning change. Right. Yes. No, but that was in 2005 because after that, uh, and that's the one that we submitted and they never answered, uh, at least the church, the community, and me, we never know why they rejected. And, and the, the new, div so you, you bid in 2005, and but not on the current RFP. Yes, we did. Okay. Because after that, what we did was when we went to them, they gave us three, uh, like I told you, three developers. So we gathered, uh, uh, we spoke to Full Spectrum, we, we signed with Full Spectrum. When we were, was, we was about to do the presentation to HPD, HPD told our member uh, that we wasn't able to use Full Spectrum because they have a financial problem, financial situation. So your frustration is that the folks the developers that you were introduced to by HPD were one of them wasn't qualified, and that ended up being the one that you ended up selecting. Okay. Not only that, because after that we choose another developer, Evanhard uh, Developer Corporation, and w when we was about to do the presentation, HPD had a situation with the building, and they called uh, Evanhard to fix the situation. Even her wasn't able to fix the situation, so they told the member of the church, told the pastor he cannot use Even her because he has a problem with us. So they said, so they said no to two out of the three that they recommended. Yes. Would you would you forward to this committee the various proposals that you submitted? Uh, sure. Perfect. Definitely. You and can, and all the the paper. To uh, bkalos at benkalos .com. I'll okay. give you. I'll give you a card. Uh, I'd like to turn it to Councilmember Ayala for questions. Okay. Buenos días. ¿Cómo está? Bien. Bien. Gracias. Pastor. So, I have. A, I mean, I, I. I'm trying to get to a place where I kind of. I have a better understanding of how you. You feel that we can be helpful. Um, this is a. A, a complicated. Um, issue that dates back to 24 years and so it becomes a little bit difficult for me to kind of you know come in and 24 years later into the conversation um I, I i'm just trying to figure out how how it is that you feel that we can be helpful well i can give you all the paperwork all the the, the letters mm -hmm. uh everything concerning the swap that we did with park and recreation everything concerning the letters that we sent to HPD, asking them to answer what we, uh, 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 the proposal. Uh, we got all the letters, we got all the information that you need. 
I can give you the package, you can reveal the package, and then we can sit down and talk about it. But whatever you want to ask me, you could do it now. So we did submit, you, you submitted, you asked, uh, you, you sent us a series of questions that you wanted HPD to respond to. We did email those to you this afternoon. I don't know if you had an opportunity to review them. No. Um, but a lot of them had to do with the swap or the uh, conversation of there ever being um, some sort of agreement to swap uh, lots. There doesn't seem to be on HPD's part, you know, any evidence, any uh, physical evidence that there was a, a deal. So if you have any information yes, we do. Um, in writing that would attest to that, I, you know, I'm happy to review it. I think that I just want to be very clear in that, you know, this project, you know, started before I became council member. And, um, you know, it's pretty, uh, you know, advanced at this point. And even if we, even if assuming that everything, you know, um, that could go wrong went wrong tomorrow, um, we cannot guarantee that the church would be awarded site control. And so I want to make that very clear. Um, I'm happy to have the discussion with you, but I think that, you know, there's been the, uh, an opportunity to have this discussion along the way. Euler processes are on a time clock, and so you know you went to the community board i know that you've had conversations with the borough president i've had conversations with our staff as well regarding this project and you know all parties seem to agree that there was enough time for the church to actually develop this site and that every deal kind of fell through because the church did just could did not have a developer um that i guess was suitable or that was eligible I'm not sure because again, this is 24 years of you know activity that I was not privy to. Can I just uh, answer you? Yes. Um, why, if that was the case, let's say that we did the presentation and they didn't like the um, uh, developer. Uh, why they didn't call us and sit down with us and let us know that that was the problem? Because they never told us. We never knew until today. HPD never said why they rejected the project, the, the project, until today. So why they didn't call us and set up a meeting and, and let us know, listen, the developer, the developer that you are going to use is not good. Get another one. You know how many developers are crazy to do a project like that there? If I could add, I mean, really, what's the worst case scenario for a developer? That we get somebody outside New York City that's never developed here? I guess in HPD's perspective, that you get a developer that doesn't have the financial means to really support this this type of project. That's what I mean, and I think that that's what they felt. And and again, we're, you know, we can have a, a further conversation, but I just want to be very clear about expectation here, and that you know, this is a project that has accelerated to a point where we're almost finalizing the Euler process, and that's on a clock, and it's very difficult to stop it once it's already begun, unless there's a real you know um, real reason. Uh, to do that, but even if I did that, even if I had the authority to do that, I could not guarantee that it's like it, it's going to be turned over to the church. And so, I I would you know like to add that as part of this process, the church would benefit from additional uh, airspace. I believe that the the land the land use uh, the zoning law would also impact your lot, and so that it would afford the church an opportunity to build on their lot. Um, and you can build the affordable housing that you're looking for, and you can build yourself a brand new church as part of this agreement, but I can't guarantee, so you know, that's an added plus um, to this because it, it, you know, it wasn't, I don't know that it was originally part of the plan, um, but it, that's exactly what will happen. So what you're saying is that even though we find out that it wasn't no fair, uh, it wasn't fair the, what they did, even though we prove you that we get everything ready for them to do it with us, uh, you can stop this? Well, you, you haven't proven that yet. You can submit to us, you can submit to, to our chair, whatever um, documentation you have, and we will seriously review that. Okay, I left the book, right? Uh, who has the book? I don't know who has the book. Okay, the, our land use division has the book. We will review it and we will have a conversation with you. Okay, please. Okay? Because, you know, uh, what I'm saying is if we if, if the process wasn't unfair... Then we will catch that. Good. I want to 
thank you for being here for a quite long hearing that started late. I want to thank Councilmember Ayala for her leadership on this. She has the full support of the land use chair, myself, and the land use staff. And uh, we look forward to supporting you on this. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify seeing on this matter? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing on this application. I will actually turn this over briefly to Council Member Levine, who will uh, lead us on land use item 58 prior to getting to a matter in his district. This is my chance to wreak havoc on this subcommittee. Free housing for everybody. Um, <laughs> I wish I had that power. Um, uh, forgive me while I read the more boring official text. Our next hearing is on land use item 58, which is 500 West 174th Street, an HDFC tax exemption application for property located in Councilman Rodriguez's district in Manhattan. Pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, this 40-year tax exemption would not only facilitate the renovation of the building, but also remove the property from the list of buildings slated for third-party transfer round 10 foreclosure actions. So I will now open up the public hearing on land use item 58. We have Artie Pearson. Uh, who is asked to testify, well not asked to, <laughs> is testifying <laughs> from HPD, please. Um, afternoon, I'm Artie Pearson. Uh, let me just do the uh, affirmation. Please state your names. Artie Pearson. Malcolm Morse. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Land use number 58 consists of an exemption area containing one privately owned building located at 500 West 174th Street, that's block 2130, lot 44, in Manhattan Council District 10. This property is a candidate for the NREM foreclosure action, third party transfer round 10, NREM action number 51, for which HPD is seeking Article 11 tax benefits. 500 West 174th Street was taken into city ownership in 1978 and subsequently entered into the tenant interim lease program. On October 27, 1992, HPD conveyed the property to the existing occupants as a low-income cooperative with no household earning more than 120% of AMI. The building is a mixed-use six-story walk-up with 27 residential units and three commercial spaces. It is fully occupied and, pro and comprises five one-buildings, one-bedrooms, 17 two-bedrooms, and five three-bedroom apartments. As shareholders have either passed away or moved, the HDFC had fewer resources to draw from in order to meet tax obligations and other operating uh, expenses. Therefore, the property became a candidate for foreclosure. Currently, the shareholders have worked out a plan to help save their buildings, which includes entering into an installment payment with the Department of en Environmental Protection in order to address arrears. The building has been working with a new property manager and within the last 12 months worked toward resolving outstanding repair issues as well as vacant units to bring in more revenue. They recently received uh, tax uh, a damp partial abatement and no preservation loan is needed. I'm sorry, they currently have a damp cap uh, partial tax abatement and no preservation loan is needed. With the required 2% increase of maintenance fees under program guidelines and the timely collection of such fees, the HGFC will have sufficient reserve funds for future needs. An effort to help maintain affordability and stability in the building, HPD is, for the council, is before the council seeking an Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years that will coincide with a regulatory agreement. Approval of the tax benefits will facilitate removal of 500 West 174th Street, HDFC, from consideration as a candidate for round 10, aiding in long-term home ownership by the shareholders. Thank you, Director Pearson. Thank you both. <laughs> and uh, we are going to move on to our next panel. Okay, thank we you. We appreciate you very much. And that will be Eva Ramirez Ramos uh, here to s testify on this same land use item, if she's still here. Okay.
I am Eva Ramirez Ramos. I live in, in 500 West 174 for a long time ago. Uh, before the building become a corporation. Um, I think so more than 30, 32 years old to live in there. Um, my building is, my building is 27 union plus three business. Um, my region that I coming over here because I didn't know about this meeting. Somebody told me last night at 8.30 a, a, a p.m. the building or the, the place have a big meeting to discuss or to talk about something or the solution HPD have for, for the uh, 11, 2000, uh, the extension 11. But I was called to Mr. Moses from HPD and then he told me it's true that the, the meeting will be coming over here to present my building problem or the building problem. My issue that I coming over here because I am very frustrated for a long time ago, always I will go to HPD to try to get the best solution for my corporation, but I never receive any help. Many people in HPD gave it to me or to show me many solutions, but when I went over there to try to resolve every single problem that we have in the corporation, economy problem, because the building is okay. Nobody didn't help me. Nobody didn't tell me the programs, the big programs and big solution HPD has for building like my building. And then I went, I went to different places. I went to different, to different to different political people to try to get the best solution for us. And never, nobody didn't care. I think so is because that people to live in there is Spanish people. Nobody didn't help us. Nobody didn't Do, get any Eva, solution. Eh, ya reloj sonó. Eh, agradecemos mucho su testimonio. Um, some of the issues you are raising are beyond the scope of this hearing. Eh, yo se lo puedo repetir en español si usted prefiere. Mm -hmm. eh, usted está tocando algunos temas que no tienen que ver con esta audiencia pública. Mm -hmm. Hay otras sí. Eh, su junta directiva tuvo que haber aprobado la propuesta para que haya llegado tan lejos. Han firmado un acuerdo que le da a ustedes un beneficio tremendo. O sea, un, al un alivio de no pagar impuestos por 40 años. Así que le beneficia a ustedes. ¿Ustedes miembro de la Junta Directiva? Sí, yo okay. vengo representándolos a ellos. Ok. Sí. Um, let, let me just pause and explain. We do, we do unfortunately have to move on, but um, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry you weren't informed of the hearing. In order for uh, this matter to have come so far in the land use process, your board would, would have and did agree to a regulatory agreement, um, one that by, by all appearances will be a great financial benefit to the building, um, which will provide, I believe, 40 years of tax relief to the building. So um, I'm sorry to hear about challenges you've had accessing HPD services and local elected officials. Um, I'm not your council member. I'm your neighbor to the south, and I'm happy to help uh, support you in that role in any way I can. Yo no soy el concejal de ustedes. Yo soy el vecino de ustedes, que vivo cerquita, pero ustedes pertenecen al, al gran concejal Irán Rodríguez. Um, con mi persona, mi oficina, estamos aquí siempre dispuestos a ayudar y también hablar con uh, su concejal Irán Rodríguez. Uh, and we, we do have to move on. Así que brevemente, eso te que da un resumen, pero ya hay otro okay. uh, asunto pendiente. Okay, but can you give it to me your the office, your place that I have to go to knock your door? Because I think so, 
every people in my building to have to decide this. Okay. Where that I have to go to find somebody to help us. I, I will give you my card. Uh, again, I'm not your council member, but happy to support you. I truly believe in HDFCs. Thank you. Gracias, Eva. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to our... Are there any more forgive me. Are there any more members of the public who would like to testify on this matter, this land use Thank item? So oh, no. Thank you for coming. All right, seeing none, I'm now going to close the hearing on this application. And we're going to move on now uh, to the main event. <laughs> uh, we've been through the undercards. <laughs> and now the prize fight. Um, which is uh, land use item 52 through 54, three land use items we're going to be considering, uh, which is on West 108th Street, an application by the West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, aka Witch Fish. Uh, in, it's in my own district, Councilmember Levine's district. The applicant, uh, HBD, seeks a zoning map change, a zoning text amendment to map the area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option two and an urban development action area project approval, including the authority to sell city-owned property for this project. If approved, a community facility containing approximately 280 supportive and affordable residential units would be developed, as well as a new transitional shelter with approximately 110 beds and replacement ambulance parking. In a later phase of the project, approximately 80 senior housing units would be developed. Under the current zoning, R8B, a community facility has a floor area ratio of 4.1 and is limited to 75 feet in height. Under the proposed R8A zoning, a community facility would have a floor, ratio, floor area ratio of 6.5 and a height of 145 feet or 14 stories with a qualifying ground floor. The residential floor area ratio would increase under the proposed zoning from 4.0 to 7.2. I'm now going to open up the public hearing on land use item 52 through 54. And uh, we have here, I believe, uh, our uh, stalwart representative from HPD, HPD Kevin Paris, uh, Paul Freitag from Wishfish, uh, Ross Carp from HPD, and uh, our own Lacey Tauber from HPD, and I'm gonna ask the committee council to administer the affirmation. Please state your names. Lacey Tauber, Government Affairs of HPD. Ross Carp, HPD. Kevin Paris, HPD. Paul Freitag, Wisfish. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes. 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 All right, you may begin. All right. Land use numbers 52, 53, and 54 are related ULERP actions seeking a zoning map amendment, establishment of a mandatory inclusionary housing area, UDAP designation, and project disposition approval for three city-owned sites located at 103-107, 137-143, and 151-159 West 108th Street in Manhattan. Council District 7, the project is known as Wish Fish at West 108 Street to be developed under the Supportive Housing Loan Program. The Supportive Housing Loan Program provides funds for the rehabilitation of existing buildings or for new construction buildings that provide supportive housing for the homeless, people with special needs, and other persons of low income. HPD works with the Department of Homeless Services as well as other public agencies to ensure that the completed projects meet programmatic guidelines. The sponsor of the project, Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, Wish Fish, was selected through a competitive process and proposes to combine the city-owned lots with a privately-owned lot located at Block 1863, Lot 10, forming the project area. The city-owned lots contain active public parking garages, all of which operate on a month-to-month -month lease between the city and garage operators. The private lot, Lot 10, is the current location of the Valley Lodge Shelter and provides transitional housing for homeless seniors with a capacity of 92 shelter beds. Under LU 54, the sponsor plans to construct two 11-story buildings with affordable and supportive housing units, as well as, a commu as community facility spaces on the disposition area and adjacent private lot. The project will be built in two phases, 
an eastern building, and a western building. In total, there will be approximately 279 units for occupancy by homeless and low-income persons, plus two units for superintendents, as well as a new transitional housing facility containing approximately 110 shelter beds. Formerly homeless tenants, referred by DHS and other city agencies, will pay up to 30% of their income as rent. Other tenants will pay rents set at up to 30% of 60% of the area median income, AMI, on an annual basis. The, I think that was supposed to be 32, not 30 up. Sorry about that. Um, the Western Buildings will be the first phase and includes 119 supportive units, all of which will be studios, and 79 affordable units that break down as follows. 53 one-bedroom, 18 two-bedroom, and eight three-bedroom apartments. Rents will vary from $191 for a supportive studio at the 30% AMI tier to $1,321 for a three-bedroom in the 68% AMI tier. The building will be energy efficient, and amenities will include 24-hour security, community room, administrative offices, social service offices, and will also contain space for the Central Park Medical Unit, CPMU, which is a volunteer ambulance service offering free emergency medical care throughout Central Park. The space will be for an office and enclosed parking for approximately three CPMU ambulances when not in use. The building would also include a new public restroom and storage area for the adjacent Anibal Aviles Playground, as well as a federally qualified health center that is available to the residents and the public in partnership with the Institute for Family Health. On-site social services will be available to all residents. During the construction period, residents of the Valley Lodge Shelter will be relocated to a facility in Community District 7. Post-construction, the shelter will be returned to the West 108th Street location and will contain 110 beds. It should be noted that the proposed shelter enlargement for Valley Lodge exceeds 25% of its current floor area, meeting the requirement for a fair share analysis, which was conducted by the Department of Homeless Services in conjunction with this application. The fair share analysis determined that the use of the site is appropriate and consistent with the criteria for the location of city facilities. The second phase of the project includes the construction of the Eastern Building that will provide 81 units of senior supportive housing and one superintendent's unit. The building will also contain community event spaces and an office suite for Wish Fish's support services. LU number 52 seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R8B zoning district to an R8A district that will provide sufficient floor area for the intended design and use of the development. LU number 53 seeks a zoning text amendment to map an MIH area utilizing option two. Because the proposed project would be community facility use group three, which is for philanthropic or nonprofit institutions with sleeping accommodations, it would not require MIH compliance. However, if a site were to be developed for residential use in the future, compliance with option two would be required. In order to facilitate construction of the Wish Fish at West 108th Street project, HPD is before the planning subcommittee requesting approval of LU numbers 52, 53, and 54. And now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Wish Fish to talk through more details of the project. Good afternoon, my name is Paul Freitag. I'm the executive director of the West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, otherwise known as Wish Fish. Um, last year, Wistfish celebrated our 40th anniversary of providing housing and services to older New Yorkers on the Upper West Side. We have a very, very long-term commitment to this community. Uh, beginning with our very first building, the Marseille Apartments, located at Broadway and 103rd, Wistfish has now grown to include 26 buildings located on the West Side in Harlem and also in the South Bronx with over 2,000 apartments. We develop, we own, we manage, and we provide services in all of our buildings. And I believe that this, the comprehensive nature of our mission is a key to our success. I would like to say that during our 40-year history, we have seen a reduction in the need for affordable housing, but, un but unfortunately, this is not the case. Today, there are over 200,000 older New Yorkers on waiting lists for affordable housing apartments, and Wistfish has actually had to close almost all of our waiting lists because the time that you would be on a waiting list often exceeds the expected lifespan of the resident on the waiting list. In community districts seven and nine, it is estimated that there are 44,000 seniors currently on waiting lists that would have them waiting more than 10 years. 
So first to talk about the project, this was already uh, introduced, but just to go through it uh, quickly. Uh, we are proposing that, I'd like to first talk about the program for this project. So this is a 100% affordable development, which includes 275 permanently affordable apartments um, in a mix of studios, one and two bedroom apartments, um, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Additionally, the development will allow us to expand Valley Lodge, our transitional shelter for older New Yorkers, which has operated at this location on West 108th Street for almost 30 years. During its 30-year history, Valley Lodge has helped literally thousands of older New Yorkers transition from homelessness to permanent housing with services. Um, this chart shows the uh, distribution of the units and the proposed rents. Um, the two phase, this is a two-phase development with 198 units being built in the first phase and 81 in the second. The senior supportive units will be targeted for older New Yorkers earning 30% of AMI, which is affordable to seniors who are living on a fixed Social Security income. The majority of the family apartments will be for families earning at or below 60% of area median income, with a percentage also for individuals at 30% of AMI. For a household consisting of a single individual, 60% of AMI is an income of about 40000 a year, um, just as a point of reference. And the family units will have a 50% uh, preference for community board seven. One of the aspects of this project that I'm most excited about is our plan to not only provide high quality affordable housing with services, but also to bring program elements that will benefit the entire community, not just our residents. Our commitment to serve the greater community has been a focus of our conversations with various community groups during the last two years, and I am so pleased to be able to incorporate their feedback into our plans. Wistfish at West 108 will include the following community services. One, we'll be working with the Institute for Family Health, a partner of Wistfish for almost 30 years, who will provide a 5,000 square foot community health center where all residents of the Upper West Side can receive primary care and medical services for themselves and their families. This health care will be affordable to all who need it. Number two, we heard from the local community about the need for restrooms in the Annabella Villas playground immediately to the west of the phase one site, and we are incorporating these restrooms into our design. We were happy to learn from our conversations with the Parks Department that with the addition of the restrooms to the playground will allow Parks Department to staff the playground with a playground associate who can then provide supervision and programming. Number three, in our conversation with Bloomingdale Family Services, we learned how having a place for them to store equipment near the playground would help them provide a richer experience for the children in their daycare and Head Start programs that use the playground on a daily basis. We are happy to incorporate the storage space into our design. Number four, during our, conversa during our public conversations, we learned that the Central Park Medical Unit, a not-for-profit ambulance corps that provides services in Central Park, was seeking a location to store their ambulances when they're not in use. We are happy to provide this for the Central Park Medical Unit and have even had additional conversations with them about how they could use our new building in order to provide first aid classes and other safety focused trainings to, um, to their members and to the community at large. Finally, we have heard from many organizations about the need for public meeting spaces. The proposed building will include a number of meeting spaces of different sizes and we are designing them in such a way so that they can be directly accessed from the sidewalk for use by the greater community for a range of functions and meetings. Wishfish currently provides community meeting space in several of our existing buildings, and we are happy to also provide this community service in this new development. So these two plans show the uh, ground floor level and the lower level. In blue are those spaces that will be dedicated to community serving services and in the orange are those shared Wistfish and community meeting spaces. So now I'd like to move on from the program to the site itself. Um, this slide shows the existing conditions on West 108th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus. Um, this is a very unusual block currently in comparison with the mostly residential east-west blocks on the Upper West Side. The north side of the block consists of the three city-owned parking garages and Wistfish's Valley Lodge transitional housing and the Annabella Villas playground. The southern side of the block is occupied almost entirely by MS-54 and its associated ball fields. Between the playground and the ball fields, a very large percentage of the block consists of open space, 
and both the playgrounds and the ball fields are mapped as parks and will remain as open space into the future. Also of note is that the existing garages are non-compliant with the current required rear setbacks and extend all the way to the rear lot, leading only to the rear of the lot line, leaving only a very narrow slot between the rear of the garages and the buildings on West 109th Street. This slide shows the proposed site plan. So to the west of Annabella Villa's playground, we have the phase one development, and to the east, we have the phase two development. Um, the proposed um, the proposed phase one building heights uh, will will uh, the proposed phase one building heights along the street will range from six to nine stories, and after a 15 foot setback, will rise to 11 stories. Um, of note is that the proposed building will conform with required rear setbacks and provides between 30 and 40 feet of breathing room between the rear of the building and the back lot line. This rear yard will be landscaped. Actually, let me go uh, back to the beginning. Um, so this shows the street elevation of the building looking south. Given the length of the facade of the building, the facade has been organized in a manner to reduce the overall massing along the street. Um, if we look at the far west, the building at the far end of this is actually an existing building. Our building has taken its cue from the existing height, stepped up one story to seven stories, then steps up to nine stories in the middle, and then steps back down to six stories immediately adjacent to the playground. Of note is that the six-story portion of the building next to the playground is only marginally taller than the existing garage in that location, and therefore will have no additional impact in terms of shadows on the playground. Um, you can see that after a 15-foot setback, the building does rise to 11 stories. Um, you can also see in this rendering in the back the 22-story Cathedral Tower building, which is on the block between 109th and 110th Street, and not shown in this view is a 17-story residential building down at the corner of Amsterdam and 108th. So our proposed building is significantly less than other, less high than other buildings in the vicinity. Our goal here was to create a building which would match the scale and context of the existing block, but also allow us to maximize the affordable housing apartments and also provide for a very rich blend of community services. In order to do this, we are requesting a zoning change from R8B to R8A. However, although R8A could have an allowable FAR 7.02, the proposed building will use only an FAR 5.3. This lower FAR would be enforced through a land disposition agreement with the city. Um, this shows the, how the facade of the building will appear at sidewalk level. The ground floor has been designed with a great deal of transparency to animate the sidewalk and allow views in and out of the spaces. The building has des been designed with numerous entrances into the residence, into the community health center, with specific entrances that can be used to access the community <coughs> meeting spaces. Overall, this development will enliven a block that currently is dominated by blank facades and by multiple curb cuts to provide access to the garages. The building that we are presenting here today is the result of a two-year process of reaching out to community organizations to present our plans and get their feedback and ideas. Specifically, this input has led to our program of community services that we are proud to have incorporated into this project. I am very grateful for the time that organizations have taken to meet with us, and as of today, we have 33 organizations who have signed on to support our efforts to create affordable housing with community services on West 108th Street. Thank you. Councilmember Levine, if you want to ask any questions. I really enjoyed that power while I had it. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, back to being a regular council member. Um, I and, do have several. And chair of the health committee. Uh, there, there is that. Uh, I do have several questions um, for you after a very thorough presentation. Um, could it would perhaps be an HPD question? Could someone explain the status of the uh, Avila's playground, which? 
I understand, um, is not entirely clear the extent to which it is mapped as city parkland or not, and what implications that might have for future development in the vicinity. Sure, I'll speak to that. Um, you're correct, it's not currently mapped as a park, but it is, um, it is property that is within the jurisdiction of the Department of Parks. So it's treated as a park um, by the Department of Parks and Recreation. So it, has, it carries with it all of the designation that a, a particular park would have. It's just not currently mapped as a park. I, is, there, is there DPA, Department of Parks and Recreation, documentation to confirm that? I can, I can send you some um, clarification documentation about that in our conversations with parks. And would this then generate floor, being that it's not mapped as parkland, would it generate floor area for future adjacent development? It would not because it's, because it's in the jurisdiction. I think we lost Phil. Yeah. We lost audio. Sergeant? Oh, we, lo we lost audio. We're back. All right. All right. So just to finish my, um, my response, so because this is a property that's under the jurisdiction and management of parks, it doesn't carry any zoning designation. It, it cannot. It is, it, is it what is known as a JOP, jointly operated park? Um, I'm not clear if, if it's under that designation. I can find out for you, though. OK. Um, we're just concerned that if it generates floor area and, um, God forbid, uh, wish fish would change its plan for the eastern building that then we could wind up with a very 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 tall structure there understood so um, I'll, I can get back to the council with our conversations with parks about this site okay and can you explain which phases of this project trigger MIH and to the extent to which you could explain why one would or would not so because this property is filing under use group three, which is um, community facility with sleeping accommodations, it doesn't, it's not considered, the FER is not considered residential and you need to be, you need to be, your project needs to be a residential pro project that is using residential FER to trigger MIH. But so for the Eastern building phase two, we would trigger MIH because it's. That's correct. Even though it would be, I presume, 100% affordable. I'm not sure what the program there is. But. Right. So, you have to. Sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> I don't know what to do here. Um, so, yeah. So, there, we're using the SARA uh, term sheet, which actually provides deeper affordability levels. Something about the way I talk, I guess. Okay. Oh. But, oh, you know what? Here, let me move my phone. Can I get back to phone? Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's really more about what would happen at, after the regulatory agreement were to expire, if that 
um, if there were something different that would happen. You know, I mean, we assume we're going to be working with wish fishes for as long as we can, you know, plan for. But um, I think the idea is um, for both phases that we'd be looking at what would happen yeah. after the regulatory agreement. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> so, so, sorry about the microphone. <laughs> um, uh, j just to understand, so um, we are concerned about the question of whether the phase two site can would trigger MIH only in the eventuality that this 40-year regulatory agreement is expired and, and then a, f a future owner could develop it. But that even if Wishfish had a radical change of mission uh, hypothetically in the next couple of years, that um, uh, this th th they would still be held to restrictions on this site. Is that correct? Yes. So hi, I'm Ross Farb. I'm the HPD project manager, especially in housing. So the first building is being financed with a supportive housing loan program, which because 60% of the building is being set aside for formerly homeless tenants, it's, it's classified by DOB as a community facility. The second phase, and so that this building will have a 60-year regulatory agreement, so whatever happens for the first 60 years, mandatory inclusionary housing uh, won't necessarily be irrelevant just because the building will be restricted to that use as we build it when we close for 60 years. The second phase, the financing has not been fully developed. Um, we are expecting it to be 100% senior building, and so um, those are often financed under a different loan program where it wouldn't be classified as a community facility, and if that is the case and it's classified as a residential building, then it will be subject to mandatory inclusionary housing. Got it. But to the extent that we're debating now over, over what option of MIH we choose, uh, it would have no impact on the program for this building as currently envisioned. Yes. Again, it's only for the eventuality that the yes, that's agreement right. expires. Um, so for phase two, the plan is that I think that project begins or construction would begin in 2023. Do I have that right? Uh, or maybe demolition begins in 2023. So that's a five-year period in which presumably the garage is still going to operate, but the site will be owned by Wishfish. Is that right? No, because we are not doing a disposition today on that. Some someone can explain that. Correct. Um, so the intent is for the first phase, we'll be doing the disposition for the first two garages, and then subsequently disposing of the third garage at the time that that project is ready to close. So this ULIP would authorize you to dispose, but you wouldn't do that. Correct. So it would it would be status quo on that lot uh, until tw until presumably twenty twenty two or whenever. Correct. Okay, understood. Um, how many building service jobs will um, this project create? So our estimate is that there will be approximately uh, 17 um, uh, positions created, building service positions created by the two buildings. The one building being the shelter and the other being the permanent affordable housing. And have, do, have you estimated phase two? Uh, we have not estimated Got phase it. two. So right. 17 phase um, on phase one yes. from the two buildings. Uh, will prevailing wage apply? No, we will not use prevailing wage in the, for the building service employees. Um, we actually, this is a project that has a great deal of community benefits. We're providing a lot of our community space um, free of rent. And as because it's a 100% affordable project, you know, obviously we're constrained. We can't raise the rents in order to generate additional re revenue. And so for that reason, the project has actually been um, planned in a way that it would not provide prevailing wage for the maintenance workers. Wishfish is not a deep-pocketed developer. You're a provider of supportive housing and homeless shelters. So I, I, I understand that you're under financial constraints. The city, however, has a stated mission of creating and supporting good paying jobs with good benefits. And this is an opportunity to do that. Building service work has been that kind of employment sector for the city, um, providing the kind of jobs that people can build a career off of and provide their, for their families and, and prepare for retirement, et cetera. 
Um, there are um, other projects, other ULURPs that have been approved in the last term uh, where we were able to find the funding to provide prevailing wage for the building service workers. Why can't the city, not asking which fish, but why can't the city put in the extra funding to make that a reality in this site? So um, the Supportive Housing Loan Program is already putting in a little bit over our term sheet for this project because of all the community benefits and to be able to um, provide extra units at 30% AMI, which is not something that we usually see in our projects. Um, we can, of course, continue to look into this, but I think it would be very hard for HPD to put in more funds in this project. I think some examples of that can happen when there's an opportunity to add more units at higher AMIs, which there's just not an opportunity to do in this project because of the way that this loan program works and also doing uh, senior housing on the, on the second phase. Um, and then there's actually also an issue with the, the fact that there's a shelter there and it's yeah. not super clear um, what kind of workers in the project would be covered under an agreement. And I think there's some concerns about um, you know, from DHS about um, hiring agreements that could interfere with their ability to enforce their own requirements for building staffing. Um, I don't want to speak for DHS, but that's something that was brought to our attention. And um, I mean, it's definitely something we've looked at, but we just don't, we don't really have the opportunity to, to budge here like we do in some other, some other term sheets, some other types of financing. All right, well, this is uh, a city with an $88 billion budget. We'll see what we approve in June. Um, we're talking about uh, probably sub six figures here as the differential on, on providing the kind of good paying jobs that, that we know you believe in and the administration believes in and I believe in and the council believes in. Um, so uh, th th this is doable from a funding perspective if we take the big picture on HPD's budget and the city's broader budget. And I would, I would implore you to continue to explore creative ways to make that happen. There's, there's something important at stake here that um, our values are on the line and, and I think we need to push the envelope um, to make that happen. Um, there's a school across the street from this site. Uh, Booker T. Washington, MS-54 um, has a uh, artificial turf athletic field, which is very, very degraded and um, desperately in need of replacement. And I've been strongly advocating that as part of this project to bring back this block to life and to do right by the school, which is going to suffer through a difficult construction period, that there'd be a replacement for that turf. Um, and I do appreciate what are very positive signals I'm receiving from the administration on that. Can you say anything about the timing of when such a turf would be installed? Yeah, so the funding for the turf is secured. Um, and we reached out to Parks on the timing and they told us that the installation is estimated to begin in 2020, um, which reflects their capital process, which includes about a year for design, which is set to begin this spring, um, and six to nine months for procurement, um, which includes the bidding period. So. Okay, uh, that lead time is very frustrating. Um, I just came from the Parks Capital Budget hearing. Um, I'm unfortunately quite uh, fluent in the uh, long time it takes to do a Parks Capital Project. But boy, this is, um, this is about as cut and dry as I would think a design project could be. You are, it's a little more than just unrolling some green carpet, but you, you're not talking about a lot of complicated elements here. Uh, there's no building, there's no comfort stra station, there's not a ton of horticulture involved. Um, I don't think there's a lot of like regrading on the site needed, if any. Uh, you know, you're, you're essentially, uh, I'm oversimplifying, but you're replacing a worn out carpet. Um, I know there will be drainage, drainage issues and, and more as long as we're doing the project, but I just don't understand why you'd need two years lead time uh, to start work, right? I think that's what you told me. Two years lead time to start work, not 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 even to complete it. Yeah, is I that mean, right? This, we hear you, and this is something that we can take back to parks and see if there's any opportunity to speed it up. 
All right, we, we're, we're going to continue to push on that. Um, so the, the, the proposed R8 zoning, uh, which would allow 6.5 FAR, um, sorry, the R8A zoning that we are proposing would allow a 6.5 community facility FAR. Um, however, it appears that you're not intending to use the full FAR, you're intending to go up to 5.3. Um, that must not be a common thing in these kinds of processes, but um, uh, again, looking to the long term here, um, how do we ensure that there's no future development uh, that would exceed uh, 5.3 FAR? So as it relates to the Wishtrish project um, in our disposition documents and our land disposition agreement documents, we're, um, we're, we're, we're going to um, mention or it's going to be in those documents that this project is going to be utilizing only the 5.3 FAR. And so we're going we're, we're gonna to memorialize it in those documents. And as it relates to future projects, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that in, even in the future project, even though we've given, we're, we will be disposing to Wishtrish, um, there may be some HPD oversight as far as future um, developers on the site. Great. Um, uh, we, we have um, raised real concerns uh, acknowledging the priority of affordable housing amongst the city's um, needs uh, of what the loss of the parking would mean for the surrounding community, and I've advocated for DOT to identify on-street parking that could be added in the surrounding vicinity to help ease the transition. And I'm wondering if you can update us. It looks like, Lacey, you have something to say on that. <laughs> yeah, I think the mic's working again. That's nice. Um, so DOT is going to be adding um, angled parking on 104th Street. Um, there'll be a gain of 33 parking spaces. Um, I mean, we know that's a fraction of the total that um, are in the garages now, but also Wishfish has done um, a really thorough job of assessing parking opportunities within uh, a one mile radius of the site um, so that if folks who are parking there now reach out, um, you know, you, your office or the BP's office or whomever that can assist them with finding al alternatives. Okay, so uh, what can you say about the timing of, of creation of new on-street parking? Um, as far as I understand, they're ready to go, and uh, you know, we can make that happen whenever you feel the timing's right. Right. I would certainly want to loop in the community board mm -hmm. um, before uh, there was any action on the ground there. Um, but as I mentioned, given the loss of parking in the garages, some mitigation seems warranted. Yeah, absolutely. We can take that back to DOT and make sure that they arrange to talk to the board. Uh, I'll also mention that as another um, mitigation step or another way to give people alternatives, um, I've worked with DOT to uh, secure expansion of car sharing in the neighborhood, which would allow people who might only need the car on weekends or a trip or two a week um, to, to um, avoid the burden of, 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 of having to pay for a car all week when you can just mm -hmm. use the car share if it's local and convenient. Um, that doesn't work for everybody, but we've heard from constituents who want that, and so we're, we're adding that to the menu of options. Um, oh, I would just add it. I think there's an opportunity to add a few more spots if the city bike stations get moved around, but maybe I think that's something that they can discuss with the community board. Okay, I, yes. Yeah. I, I, I'd actually ask DOT to look at that. There mm -hmm. um, probably, as you say, a chance to move docks from street to sidewalk, and um, with consultation of the community board, we should pursue that as well. Yeah. Um, the, the chair raised a good question, which is, given concerns about the, lo the long-term fate of the property, and we're thinking here very far ahead, um, would it not be appropriate to put a deed restriction to restrict to um, supportive housing and or um, other such uses? Yeah, 
I don't think any of us probably will be the. Well, I think we can get back to you on that as far as um, the agency's perspective on doing the deed restriction at this site to that effect. Okay, we, we would appreciate you uh, getting back to us on that. Yes. Um, I I have worked to advocate for the broader community in this process, and um, Paul mentioned a few of things that I think will matter to people um, who. Uh, live nearby or, or, or go to school nearby or have the kids school nearby. I just want to reemphasize them because they're things that we have fought for and that we're, we're very excited that Witch Fish has now been able to include and or HPD, uh, including a bathroom for Avila's Playground, which is sorely needed, which would trigger, we hope, uh, provision of a playground associate by the Parks Department, uh, a staff person who not only cares for the bathroom, that's an important function, but runs programming for young people, play groups and summer learning activities, and it's an extra pair of eyes on the playground. So it's just wonderful to have that kind of staff person uh, there on site. Um, I believe Paul, Paul also mentioned they were going to be able to secure storage space for a great early childhood education center, Bloom, uh, Bloomingdale Family Services, that does often um, bring their kids uh, to the park to play and to have a little bit of storage for their materials and their um, play items would be very nice for them and we're, we're certainly excited about that. Um, there's a great need for more meeting space in the community and um, the fact that your design includes a meeting space which has a separate street entrance so that it really could feel like something the community could be at home at, um, I think will be welcome. And the Central Park Ambulance Corps is just one of these great, great, great little groups that doesn't get the credit it deser deserves, but these are all volunteers who are providing emergency medical care through the park and sometimes in, adja in adjacent <coughs> blocks. And to have a permanent home for them, a modernized home, um, is really a great benefit to park users in the broader neighborhood. And we're very happy that that is also um, gonna be part, is currently part of the design. Um, and the, 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 um, the establishment of a new community clinic, uh, a federally qualified health facility, um, is going to provide very much needed low-cost medical care services that are going to be available to residents uh, regardless of income and ability to pay and regardless of immigration status. And so we are um, very excited about that benefit for the community as well. Um, again, I think it's important to consider the broader impact on the community and the needs of the community um, in making the ultimate, ultimate determination on the project. That is all the questions I have. Um, I'm going to pass it back to the chair um, to uh, perhaps move on to the next panel. I'm anxious to hear from the public and or proceed with his own questions. So I just want to reiterate uh, Councilmember Levine's uh, great questions, uh, and I fully support them, and they need to be addressed if it's going to move out of this committee, and I do appreciate the idea of throwing a deed restriction on there to say that it has to be a nonprofit, that it has to be supportive housing, uh, so that if anyone does come as a successor agency and does decide that they want to use the additional FAR that you're being gifted but not using, that it will continue with the land. Uh, that being said, I do want to just echo Councilmember Levine. It seems that what you need is an R7D, not an R8A. I'm not sure if we received from you the list of changes, the, the list of waivers you would need in order to build in an R8A. It also seems that uh, there appears to be a problem with MIH as design that should be brought to city planning in that supportive housing being built in an MIH zoned location doesn't get the MIH bonus, which seems strange. 
So uh, this may be an opportunity to fix that so that if you build 100% supportive housing, uh, that that should satisfy MIH requirements. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I just I did want to speak. You were referring to the R7D. I just wanted to clarify the distinction that for, for zoning purposes, this project needs to u utilize the community facility FAR. Um, that's um, part of the zoning designation. So with the R7D, my understanding is that the community facility FAR is only a 4.2, and this project needs to utilize um, 5.3 FAR to, to realize its... And in R7D, what is the inclusionary housing bonus? Um, I believe it brings you up to a 5.6. Six. Six, probably. And if you're in this whole project, is a, in the first building that you're putting up, which is use group three by nature of being supportive housing, is there any market rate? Sorry, I didn't catch the question. Uh, do you have any, any market this? rate in any of this development? No. no. Um, so the, the question would be, that I'm asking HP to bring back to city planning is why if we build a shelter or if we're building supportive housing, why that doesn't satisfy inclusionary housing, especially if all the beds are close to each other and there are no separate doors for different people. Right. My understanding is that MIH was designed for residential, um, so but you, you know, we bring up- But the folks are gonna be sleeping there, right? They're right. gonna be part of the community. They're gonna live there. It's Understood. But for the fact that uh, Article 2, Section Chapter 2, uh, says specifically that uh, nonprofit sleeping accommodations in non R8, R9, and R10 districts uh, are a different use group, then it would be residential. So, okay. And if it was residential, just to be clear, the MIH would apply. Uh, and right, but the MIH only requires a certain percentage be affordable. So, so yeah, just tack on to the deed restriction. It still has to maintain. Uh, it, let's restrict it to 100% affordable uh, supportive housing or shelter and or all. Okay, I would like to excuse this uh, panel. And uh, we have our next panels. As mentioned before, there are a lot of folks testifying. It appears... Uh, okay, we, we have... Uh, Many, many people testifying in favor. So we're gonna ask those people if they don't mind doing two minutes. Uh, we have Dan Cohen, Friends of Annabelle Avia's Playground, Ellen Finney from Dorot, Revan Alistar Drummond from the West End Presbyterian Church, and Lynn Wishart from the First Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Uh, slightly out of that neighborhood, but uh, welcome and please begin. Greetings, Chairman Kalos, uh, Councilman Levine. Um, I, um, I'm here as president of Friends of Annabella Villas Playground in support of the West 108th Street development proposed by Wishfish. I was a member of Community Board 7 when the garages were previously up for consideration some 15, 20 years ago, and at the time I voted in favor of keeping them as garages rather than allowing them to be sold off to private developers. That was the right decision then, but the circumstances have changed now. Now we have a community besieged by market rate development, a record loss of affordable units every year, and a proposal from a trustworthy and reliable nonprofit to build a 100% affordable project. The time has come for the garages to go. The playground is going to be the beneficiary of the project with a new bathroom, which will enable the Parks Department to staff our playground, provide storage space for parks maintenance, and provide daily oversight, programming, and activities for our children during warmer months. But even without the restrooms, FOAAP would still support this project. The park is on a recent upswing. A safety fence, repainting and replanting, and increased use of the park have breathed life into the playground. I might add also by the generous support of the councilman as well. But it is not too long ago that drug paraphernalia was routinely found in the playground, surrounded on two sides by parking garages and a third side by the shrouded rear yards of West 109th Street tenements. It has regularly attracted drug dealers and users who could operate at night in relative darkness and largely undisturbed. The new development will put people with east-facing windows overlooking the park, discouraging illegal activity and increasing security and safety in the playground. It will also improve 108th Street overall 
currently with two parks, a playground, and little housing by augmenting the number of pedestrians putting eyes on the street and further enhancing the block. I park my car nearby at West 110th Street in the Avalon Building where I live with my family. No doubt my parking rates will increase with the reduction of the spaces in this garage. But the increased safety and security, new affordable units, and a new bathroom for the playground, the choice is clear. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Finney, Community Outreach Social Worker at DeRote, representing Mark Meredy, Executive Director of DeRote and resident of Community Board 7. DeRote would like to reaffirm our steadfast support of Wistfish and the development of the 10 West 108th House Street Housing Project. DeRote has been serving older adults on the Upper West Side and Manhattan Valley for over 40 years. Our mission is to alleviate social isolation and provide services and support in, and to enable older adults to live independently as valued members of the community. We are familiar with the challenges faced by older people in this community, particularly with those who struggle to maintain housing. For over 35 years, DeRote has partnered with Wistfish to operate our homeless prevention program. The program has saved hundreds of neighborhood seniors from homelessness by offering them transitional housing and a range of services. Wishfish has been an outstanding partner in our shared mission of supporting seniors and preventing homelessness. The seniors who come to, come to us are ordinary New Yorkers. In recent years, we have struggled to find them housing in this neighborhood or in any neighborhood in the city. At this time, over 200,000 New York City seniors are on the waiting list for affordable housing. Waits are typically five years or longer, far too long for a senior citizen to wait. The West Side Federation project at West 108th Street will create a much needed affordable housing for seniors and families and invaluable community assets such as space for healthcare, social services, and recreation that are vital to our community. In our experience, Wishfish is the most qualified and responsible organization to fulfill this need. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Alastair Drummond. I'm the pastor of the West End Presbyterian Church, um, which is three blocks south of um, Valley Lodge on 105th Street. I've uh, been pastor there for 24 years, and uh, as a neighbor of Valley Lodge and a board member of Wishfish for 12 of those years, um, and um, uh, uh, as in being involved with Wish Wish, I know our, our that we've been a good and responsive member of the community for all of these years. With 40 years of experience, Wish Wish can clearly manage big, complex construction projects in residential neighborhoods, including the Red Oak Building on 106th Street and Tres Puentes in the Bronx. Um, and Wish Wish is Part of, always part of the community they operate in, very responsive to residents' disputes that may arise. Valley Lodge has operated on West 108th Street successfully for more than 30 years. Wishfish at one West 108th is a very necessary resource for our neighborhood. New York City continues to wrestle with housing affordability, especially in Manhattan. As Paul said earlier, 200,000 seniors are on wait lists for affordable housing units alone. The need is very real. Wishfish is the kind of top-tier responsible prov provider that can help pr to protect our neighborhood from the effects of rapid gentrification and help to preserve the income diversity that makes Manhattan Valley very special while continuing to provide resources for low-income seniors to live with security and with dignity. So I support Wishfish at one, West 108th and the services, all the services it will provide for all of Manhattan Valley. In January of 2017, the annual Interfaith March for Peace, which gather, which marches through the, the, the oh, my time's gone, M took the theme of if you don't mind giving yeah. one sentence. Yes, perhaps. one sentence. It took the theme of supporting this project and stopped in all the faith communities on the west side because of the commitment of the whole community to this particular project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring up the next panel. Good afternoon.
Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Wishart. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. As a director, I am aware of the Federation's successful housing developments that have been concentrated in several communities throughout Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx over the last four decades. I'm also a member of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, and as the council member noted, it is located out of the Upper West Side at 7 West 55th Street. The church has supported ministries with people experiencing homelessness and cooperated with many not-for-profit organizations serving a variety of needs of older adults since at least the mid-1980s. As a congregation, we understand that our faith-based institutions, our individual efforts as citizens of this city, and our governing authorities share the responsibility to nurture vibrant communities, in part by addressing housing insecurity and homelessness in our neighborhoods. Today I speak in support of the West 108th Street development from my perspective as a member of this church by describing one of its efforts with Wasisha's Valley Lodge to shelter and foster community for homeless older adults. With support from the Department of Homeless Services, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church and Valley Lodge partnered first with Church of the Ascension on West 107th Street and then in successive years with West End Presbyterian Church on West 105th Street in sheltering 10 men at a time for four months during six consecutive winters. During these intermittent, incredibly brief, brief periods, because of the quality of services and care provided by staff of Valley Lodge, 94 individuals, many of whom having experienced decades of homelessness and unwillingness to accept assistance through options offered by DHS, moved from living as unsheltered individuals on Manhattan's west side into transitional and permanent housing. Valley Lodge has been a good neighbor on West 108th Street for 30 years. The proposed development increases the capacity of the Valley Lodge shelter, addresses a critical need for supportive housing for older adults, and adds to the permanently affordable housing options for families in Manhattan Valley. I'll just very briefly um, thank you, Len, and, and Reverend Drummond, and Alan, uh, and Dantu, who's not here anymore, for, um, for coming and speaking out and for um, thinking about the needs of the community beyond. Uh, it doesn't apply to wish fish that's your bread and butter, but it's great to see a faith-based institution, a senior-based nonprofit, thinking about the broader needs of the community. I wish we saw more of that. And um, I do appreciate you engaging and waiting and getting your voices on the record today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, turn this back over to Council Member uh, Levine. And uh, our next panelist is Panos K from 32BJ. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Panos Kutris. I'm a building service worker and a member of 32BJ SEIU. I'm sure to call on the city to fund good building service jobs at West 108th Street. Our union has a historic relationship with the West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. We also believe that good jobs and affordable housing should go hand in hand. As long as there are working people earning too little to afford rising housing costs, the affordable housing crisis will continue. That is why we are calling on the subcommittee to urge the city to ensure that they are creating good building service jobs at this development. Providing good jobs is an important part of res uh, responsible development. Good jobs uh, can help New Yorkers out of poverty and allow workers at the site to support their families and continue to call New York, New York home. Thank you. Persopoli Panos. Could, could you uh, remind us where is it that you're currently working? My building? Yes. I'm on the Upper East Side. Got it. But you are you are in a resident, you are doing residential building service work yes, currently. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a doorman. Got it. I'm a doorman. So, uh, work similar to uh, what will be done here. It's a building service work. I'm a building service worker. Okay. Well, we, we, we thank you for, first of all, for the work you're doing uh, keeping New York City livable. 
Thank you. Uh, building service workers are, are often underappreciated, but um, are making it possible for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers to remain in their homes. Exactly. We thank you for that. Exactly. Uh, and we thank you for speaking out on behalf of Good Jobs and this project. Exactly. I'm not sure if you were here during my questions uh, with the administration, here. but um, I express my belief that. Um, and thank you. That uh, our values as a city um, should steer us to create good jobs with good wages and benefits. So, um, again, thank you for speaking out and for, for your work and, and for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have. Um, Karen, and forgive me if I mispronounce the last, last name, Jorgensen, I think. Uh, Elisa Wallman. Bud Courtney. And Mark Greenberg. Hi, my name is Karen Jorgensen. I've been the director of the Valley Lodge Shelter on West 108th Street since we opened in 1988. And we are a proud program of WISFISH, serving 92 homeless men and women 50 years of age and over. And with me today are residents, alumni, and staff of Valley Lodge. At Valley Lodge, I get calls daily from people already evicted as well as those facing eviction because their income is no longer enough to pay the rent and eat. These calls come from all over the city, including from some of the city council district offices, Mr. Levine, because we do have two of your people currently in Valley Lodge referred by your district office. And we are working very hard to get them housed in affordable housing. Um, as I said, there are many people at Valley Lodge who worked all their lives and were responsible tenants but were forced into the shelter system. Their Social Security retirement is usually no more than $1,000 a month, not enough to afford any apartment on the open market. And as people are evicted, more and more apartments go out of stabilization into fair market rental. And in the Manhattan Valley neighborhood, where Valley Lodge is located, they are advertising apartments renting for $3,000, $4,000, and $5,000 a month. Years ago, the board of directors of Wispish made the decision to have only one shelter, Valley Lodge, and to devote all of our future efforts to the development and preservation of affordable housing. The city has indicated its commitment to affordable housing, and we do not want to lose this opportunity as daily affordable apartments are lost in the Manhattan Valley neighborhood as well as in the rest of the city. So we urge the subcommittee to support and approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elisa Wallman, and I'm the Director of Community Programs at the Institute for Family Health, a federally qualified health center network that has been providing comprehensive primary care in medically underserved communities in New York City for more than 30 years and in upstate New York for more than 10 years. We also operate three residency training programs for family medicine and a number of community health and health promotion programs. In New York City, the Institute offers primary care, behavioral health care, dental care, at nine full-time health centers, five school-based health centers, six sites that care for people who are homeless. Services are available for people of all ages, regardless of insurance status or ability to pay. The Institute has been working with the Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing since 1990, when we began providing services at Valley Lodge, a transitional shelter for vulnerable homeless adults. An Institute family physician provides primary care two days a week at Valley Lodge, working closely with the Valley Lodge staff to coordinate services. On average, we provide 1,000 primary care visits per year to the residents of Valley Lodge. I personally have worked very closely for the past 27 years with the staff of Valley Lodge coordinating the Institute's healthcare services. The Institute is thrilled to be part of the WISFISH project at 108th Street. The Institute will occupy roughly 5,000 square feet of community space for healthcare, 
serving both the residents of the new building and the community at large. The Institute has a history of developing health centers in collaboration with community partners and looks forward to working with the Upper West Side Manhattan Valley community to help meet its primary care health needs. As a longtime community partner, Wispish will help make this block of 108th Street more vibrant, pedestrian-friendly place that will promote health and well-being of the entire neighborhood. Wispish has a strong track record of designing, building, and managing complex developments in residential neighborhoods, and the Institute for Family Health is happy to support Wispish and to be a part of the services it will provide on the Upper West Side of Manhattan Valley. Thank you. I'd like to thank Councilman Levine for your your edict on the eradication of homelessness. I thank you for that. It's nice to know that there's many dreamers at this time, that's certainly what we need. My name is Bud Courtney. I live and work at the Catholic Worker on the Lower East Side. I apologize the way I'm dressed. I rushed here from our soup line thinking that I wouldn't have to sit here for a while. But I've been the choir director at Valley Lodge for the last five years. I, I lead a choir of alumni and folks in transitional housing who live at Valley Lodge. I've seen the work that, that, the, other, that the folks at Valley Lodge do and at Wispish. Um, and for me, it's a family. It, it's, it's not a shelter. I, I live and work with people every day at the Catholic Worker, people in off the street. I'm spending, this is the, the Catholic season of Lent and one night a, a week. I'm going out and spending the night on the streets to try to understand a little bit of homelessness. And for myself, one night a week is hell. So I can't imagine how folks day after day, year after year, live on the streets. So the need to have a home to take people in is so necessary and important. Not only at Valley Lodge do they do that, but they have programs such as the choir and the drawing department where people keep coming back. The alumni return because it's something to do. I'm a recovering alcoholic, 26 years sober. I know how important it is to have something to get you off the streets, away from the temptation, and to have folks come in and sing with us week after week. This past June, we, we sang at Carnegie Hall, the, the Valley Lodge Choir. We performed at, Valley Lodge, at Carnegie Hall with the Dallas Street Choir, the only homeless choir ever to be invited to Carnegie Hall. And I know for myself, and I speak for probably every member of the choir, it's one of the highlights of our life. So please vote yes on this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bud, for the incredible service you're doing to give back. Uh, you said, so you work at Mary House? You're St. the Catholic Joe's. work? St. Joe's. Oh, got it. Um, so you're doing work on, in multiple locations, helping people in need. And, and we're, we're grateful for that thank and you. appreciate you taking time out to come Put your voice on the record here. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, council members, for taking a few moments to join us here. Mark, check that your mic's on. There we go, Hal. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Mark Greenberg. I want to first thank the uh, council and this, the committee for the great questions and the challenges that you're offering to Wispish to make this project even greater than it uh, might otherwise be. Uh, my name is Mark Greenberg. I'm the executive director of the Interfaith Assembly on Homelessness and Housing. Uh, coalition of over 60 faith institutions established in the Upper West Side on, in 1985, and I'm here to sp uh, strongly support this project. Since its inception of the assembly, we've looked to the West Side Federation for Senior Supportive Housing as a crucial and dependable ally in our work of helping those who are homeless to rebuild their lives and of helping build a more compassionate New York City. I'm pleased to speak in strong support of the current efforts of Wispish to expand its Valley Lodge facility to serve more New Yorkers in need of affordable housing through its West 108th Street project. The need for permanent affordable housing in New York City has never been greater than it is right now, and the pressures on existing affordable units and those who live in them are increasing every day. With over 60,000 New Yorkers living in shelters, many thousands more in the streets, and tens of thousands doubled or tripled up with family or friends, this innovative project from Manhattan Valley that will include 194 permanent affordable housing and the New Valley Lodge shelter serving 110 older adults, 18 more than today, is exactly what the people of our city and our community need. When completed, these housing resources, coupled with health care, child care, community meeting spaces, public bathrooms, uh, will be an invaluable resource and will help um, preserve the rich diversity that makes this community one of the greatest places on the globe to live and work. 
Clearly, any new project of this magnitude has its challenges. In its four, over 40 years of service, Westfish has proven time and time again that it's up to the challenge. And on behalf of the members of the Assembly and those we, wish we seek to serve, I'm proud to stand in support of this project. Look forward to working with members of the Upper West Side community to ensure that the needs and concerns of the community are considered at every juncture in the de development of this very impressive, worthy, and desperately needed endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the first uh, work you do in leading the coalition. It's incredibly important and for um, everything you do on behalf of this cause. Um, Alicia, just before I let you guys go, if you could briefly say a word or two on um, the staffing and services of the facility, how many doctors, nurses, and the scope of, if, if, you, if, you, if, if you're not prepared to, you could get back to me. Fair enough. Okay, thank you, panel. Thank you. I'm very pleased that we've been joined by our colleague on the subcommittee who was busy chairing his own committee uh, hearing today, which is why he couldn't be with us, Andy King. And we're going to um, pause this hearing to uh, resume a vote so that Councilmember King can register his voice. And I'm going to pass it over to the committee council to administer that. Continue vote to approve land use items 41, 42, and 43. Council Member King. Vote aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you, Council Member King. Now we're going to resume our hearing on uh, land use items 52, 53, 54. And I'll call up the next panel, which will consist of. Okay, we have, I think it's Eustacia Smith. Okay, Sandy Roach is here. Uh, Stephanie Ruiz and Rebecca Sauer. And I know for some of you who have been waiting, this was a long time, um, but it really is valuable to have voices from the public who are entered on the record this way. And everything you're saying here, you probably know this, is recorded, it's transcribed, and it's being streamed live. And um, it, it really does matter when the public speaks up. So uh, thank you all for waiting. And Sandy, we'll pass it off to you first. OK, my name is Sandy Roach, yeah. Sandra Roach. And I've lived in the Manhattan Valley community for 55 years. Um, I'm very active in community life. I currently serve as the board chair of the Bloomingdale Family Program, a very highly regarded Head Start and child care program in Manhattan Valley, and we're very happy we'll be able to store our trikes and our outdoor play equipment and not have to schlep it over to the playground every time we, every time we use it. I've seen enormous changes, good and bad, in Manhattan Valley in the past 50-some years. But the most dramatic change in recent years has been the explosive gentrification that has, is changing who we are as a community. This is a great place to live and have a family. I raised my three children here and grandchildren too. Uh, and it's a great place to live because it has such a vibrant mix of families in this community. But today, it's increasingly hard for low-income families and low-income seniors to live here, uh, even though many have deep and long-standing ties and roots in this community, affordable housing is disappearing in favor of luxury rentals and condos. To stay in this community, many of the low-income families we serve are doubling up and tripling up in apartments, a whole family living in one room, two or three families sharing a kitchen. It's a terrible way to live. It's inadequate and unsafe. The Wish Fish Project on West 108th Street offers an opportunity to provide these families with a decent and affordable place to live and with services that strengthen the entire community. I share the respect of the Manhattan Valley community for the high quality of services provided by Wish Fish. This new facility will be a much needed and much valued asset to our entire community. Impeccable timing, Sandy. I wish some of my colleagues could learn from your example. Um, and, and Bloomingdale is just, just an amazing organization. Yeah. And um, 
to strengthen your connection to that park through this small accommodation is really would, would be a great thing. So Very nice. thank you for all your service, please. So Stephanie unfortunately had to step out. My name is Caitlin Hosey. I'm standing in for her. I'm happy to fill out a card afterwards. Um, I am a public policy associate for Live on New York. Live on New York strongly supports with Fish 108. At West 108, this project would support the entire community and aligns with our mission to make New York a better place to age. With Fish is a longstanding member of Live on New York as well as an active member of our affordable senior housing coalition. New York City currently faces an unprecedented affordable housing crisis, which has been outlined earlier today. It is one that affects every community throughout New York. As found in our 2016 study, an estimated 200,000 low-income seniors are on waiting lists for affordable housing throughout New York City. This is simply on one type of affordable housing through the HUD 202 program. This housing crisis is intensified as the cost of living continues to rise, which is particularly detrimental for seniors who often live on fixed incomes. We released an update to our 2016 study which found an estimated 19,700 seniors on waiting lists specifically in community districts seven and nine of which this project is located within. At an overall response rate of 44% of the HUD 202 buildings, it is estimated that 44,000 are actually on waiting lists in this, in this area. With a total of 45 units on average turning over the, each year, the odds of getting an affordable housing unit are increasingly bleak. It is for these reasons, in addition to all the community facilities and the true mission-based nature of Wispish West 108, that we are happy to endorse this project and we are happy to support the community-driven effort that is going on here today. Thank you. Great, thank you. We love Live On. Thank you for speaking. Thank you. Go okay. ahead. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Councilmember Levine, or good evening. My name is Rebecca Sauer. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at the Supportive Housing Network of New York. We're a membership organization representing about 200 nonprofits across the state that develop and operate supportive housing. So WISPISH is one of our members. Um, supportive housing, as you know, is permanent affordable housing with support services, and it ends homelessness amongst the most vulnerable by providing both a respectful, affordable place to live and person-centered support to help tenants stay housed and healthy. I'd like to speak in, speak in support of the proposal for West 108th Street. So Wispish is actually one of the founders of the supportive housing model, having come to the mission of creating affordable housing with embedded services in order to serve the people who were in the late 70s, just then appearing on the Upper West Side with all of their belongings and shopping carts. Wispish's founder, Reverend Laura Jervis, decided to do something about the problem, learning the complexities of housing development along the way. Today, as we've heard, the organization has created 1,800 apartments, mostly on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, but in other neighborhoods as well. In the first 10 years, Wispish took over dilapidated single-room occupancy hotels, gutted them, and turned them into small efficiency apartments. Many of the projects that they worked on received um, very staunch opposition from the community, but in fact, none of the fears that the community members had came to pass. Um, Euclid Hall is one example. Wispish promised the renovation would not lead to increased crime, and that has been the case. They promised the renovation would improve the neighborhood, and anyone who shopped at the neighboring Victoria's Secret or enjoyed a smoothie at Juice Generation can attest to how true that has been. Wispish has been a good neighbor, has always fulfilled their promises, and for the past more than 30 years has had the staunch support of their neighborhood. You can see that here today because they've earned it. I can also speak to the need for the West 108th Street project with great certainty. Just want to say we did a couple of years ago in preparation for the NYC 1515 program, um, did looking into the um, demographics of the Department of Homeless Services, um, and we found actually that of the chronically homeless single adult population, just under a third were over 55. So Wispish is the only provider that's exclusively dedicated to serving this population, which is why it's so important that a project like West 108th Street come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And as a reminder, the plan then for this project is 50 years and older for the, for the single adults. Is that right? And then uh, for the family portion, it's, it's, there's, there's no age restriction. Understood. Okay. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for your very strong statement. And thank you to this panel.
and uh, we have a solo act for the final panel, which is Nathan Gebert. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. And while Nathan is getting settled, are there any other members of the public who would like to testify? Okay. If you, if Mickey, if you can just fill out a speaker slip, yeah. you already. Uh, We, we would welcome you. Um, you could actually join this panel if you're all. Okay. Nathan, take it away. My name's Nathan Gabbert, and uh, I'm uh, representing myself. Um, and for 23 years, I have lived on the top floor of 138th uh, West 109th Street directly behind Valley Lodge and the proposed development. I will lose some light and air and experience inconvenience should the project go ahead. I also park my car on the street and the demolition of the garages might make that more difficult. I speak nonetheless to express my unambiguous support. We must do everything we can to create more affordable housing in this city. If I have to give up something to see that that is done, I am happy to do so. As New Yorkers, this is what we do for each other. And I am excited to welcome new people to this neighborhood that I love. By sharing, we only make it better. Hi. What, what, what a lovely statement. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here and sharing that with us. It's not, not the statement I was expecting to hear. <laughs> OK. Go ahead, Mickey. Okay. I changed if my you mind. can identify yourself, uh, my name I know is you Mickey well. Mickey Navarro. Um, I'm here today in support of affordable housing in the neighborhood that I love, a neighborhood where I grew up, where I have a lot of memories. And, the, and I had given my, my slot up because um, I've spoken in many areas in the city about how I feel about affordable housing and wish fish. But I realized that um, everyone, there's, I'm a product of that community. And I've been in that community for over 60 years. I came in that community with my grandparents and my parents and five siblings in 1948. Just forget that figure. <laughs> um, I've seen drastic changes. And the saddest part of the changes are affordable housing because it meant that my fa a lot of members of the, my family had to leave the neighborhood. It meant that a lot of the people I grew up with had to leave the neighborhood. It meant that a lot of the Latinos that I um, have embraced and the ones that we created memories in that neighborhood and the ones that stayed during the hard times are gone. Uh, many are gone. And many of them will continue to leave if we don't allow wish fish to continue to build affordable housing. Wish fish is the only one in that neighborhood that I know that is building affordable housing for young families and, and, and seniors. 194 units, it's just like a drop in the bucket to what we need in that neighborhood. And so um, to have people oppose that uh, for, for, um, for cars has been really awful for me, this whole process. I mean, two and a half years we've been living with this. And we finally come uh, to the end of it, I hope. I hope that you uh, come to my center lots of times. You know who we are. You know the services we give to the community. You know that we're the only ones doing 30% of their income. I, we've had, I've had a client, I'm a social worker, I had a client that only paid $1 one year because that's all she could, she could afford according to her income because of her expenses. If we look at the expenses, she, that year she had hearing aids that she had to purchase, she had glasses that she had to purchase, and because of those purchases, we could bring down, down the, the rent that she paid for that year. I don't know anybody else is doing that. I could work someplace else. I c I'm committed to the mission Wish Fish has. I am committed to that community. I still work there. I still have family there. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to fight every, everyone who thinks that they could push us out. And this is my way. I appreciate Wish Fish giving me the opportunity 
to come to you and fight for the neighborhood that I love, that I grew up in, and that is still a wonderful place. We're just trying to make keep it. We try to keep it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mickey. You run one of the best senior centers I've ever seen. Two, I got seen. two. So stand corrected for the record. I got two Doug, of the best senior Doug centers Doug. I've ever seen. All right. So, okay, I'm now going to close the public hearing, and uh, we're also going to lay over land use items 52 to 59. Uh, I want to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing, and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. And this hearing is hereby adjourned. <laughs>